meeting then to order. And we'll start with our pledge to the flag so if everyone can stand. Well, the flag has disappeared, <laughs> so we will. Guess what? We'll get the flag on the wall over there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we'll go All right, right there. Okay. okay. Right. And Mr. Michael Travis, if you can lead us. Our pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Ives? Yes. Shaw? Here. Travis? Here. Navarro? Here. Lewandowski? Here. Johnson? Here. Lopez Caniva? Here. We'll start with our resolution, our Eagle Scout, Jacob Kennedy. You got it. Um, unfortunately, Jacob, I uh, just got an email about an hour ago. Jacob is not able to make it, but I thought we would go ahead and read the resolution anyway, just because of the significance of his accomplishment. And also, Jacob is a alum now, um, so it's likely in July and August he will be thinking about where he will be next. Uh, so this is a resolution uh, recognizing Jacob Emerson Kennedy uh, for achieving Eagle Scout status, the highest uh, status you can get in the Boy Scouts of America. Whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy, a senior student and now an alum at Lockport Township High School District 205, has achieved Eagle Scout status, the highest rank awarded by the Boy Scouts of America, for his project of managing scouts and other volunteers to follow steps to complete the family meeting room library that included a book drive, clean and sorted donated books, designed, constructed, painted bookshelves, and assembled a children's library with book selections ranging from birth to age 21 at the SOS Children's Village in Lockport. And whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy also assisted the children at SOS Children's Village that encouraged residents to relax through reading. He helped those most vulnerable in the community he had to navigate through COVID-19 restrictions and altered timelines, which was challenging due to the nature of leading volunteers. He included symptom checks, mask wearing, creating outdoor work sessions, all things we're familiar with, and additional <laughs> safety protocols to keep his volunteers safe and healthy. Whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy has brought honor and distinction to himself, his family, school, community, scoutmasters, and Lockport Troop Number 50 by achieving this status, and whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy was aided and guided in these achievements by his family and scoutmaster Jacob Tracy just came in. Sorry to interrupt you. Just Jacob, you just came in. <laughs> Jacob, so stand on up so we can acknowledge you. I apologize. I got an email that, yeah, give you a round of applause. Well, I apologize, Jacob. I got an email that you weren't going to be able to make it, but we're certainly glad that you are here. So I'll finish reading this. Is this your family? Yeah. Well, come on in. Yeah, you all have to come on in. You can stand right over here, and we'll be sure to, to, get, a, to get a picture of you. Um, I was just finishing reading the resolution, and... Um, for the Kennedy family, I'm just going to back up a little bit, okay? Uh, just talk a little bit about what we did. So I apologize to anybody who's going to hear it again, but I'm sure like for you to hear this resolution. Um, so I introduced the project and the highest honor in Boy Scouts of America. So I'm just going to back up to the work that you, you did, okay, Jacob? Is that all right? Yeah. Great. Uh, whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy also assisted the children in SOS Children's Village that encouraged residents to relax through reading, he helped those most vulnerable in our community. He had to navigate through COVID-19 restrictions and altered timelines, which was challenging due to the nature of leading volunteers. He included symptom checks, mask wearing, creating outdoor work sessions, and additional safety protocols to keep his volunteers safe and healthy. And whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy has brought honor and distinction to himself, his family, school, community, scoutmasters, and Lockport Troop Number 50 by achieving this status and Whereas Jacob Emerson Kennedy was aided and guided in these achievements by his family and scoutmaster Tracy Clough. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education of Lockport Township High School District 205, Will County, Illinois, on this 21st day of June 21st. So congratulations. So, so we got to get a picture of your family. Can you introduce who this is with you, Jacob, so we just know? This is my stand-up. Yeah, yeah, it's a stand-up situation. This is my mom, too. Yeah. My dad, Brian, and my little sister, Jania. Awesome. Great, great. Now I'm going to come on over, and we got a certificate for you as well. And uh, Mrs. Wheeler, it didn't, you know, didn't happen to Um, and if you are um, at your pleasure, you can 
done unmasked. Um, since the pandemic, so so we'd rather have a picture with the uh, on that. So. On behalf of the Board of Education, congratulations on your Eagle Scout, and we are very proud of you. And, and again, as Dr. McBride say, we're going to continue with our with our business here. You're welcome to stay. Again, you're, you're free to go. Thank you again for coming, even if it was like better late than never. Yeah, right? we're so glad we ever. got to see you. Yeah, yeah congratulations. So Thank you. Yep. No, no worries. No, no worries. No worries. It's all good. It's all good. Congratulations, Jake. Congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Enjoy your summer. All right. There is no uh, student reports. AFT, there is none. All right. ISB governing board reports. Uh, governing board is coming up for a meeting. I don't have a date on top of my head, but I'm registered to go to it. It's going to be virtual online. Uh, this is where we discuss what programs mm -hmm. we want to uh, present to the region and uh, also elect officers. So I think we're up for new officers this year. Okay. Uh, other than that, we got to everybody have your packet, the Triple uh, I. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go to some of the pre-conference workshops, let Kathy know. Uh, usually they're pretty good. So. So you should consider taking one, if not two. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Foundation board report, Mr. Ives. Yes. Uh, Kate Dean couldn't make it today, and I said, oh, I'll be happy to step in. Mm -hmm. We, uh, It has been a very busy uh, year end. Uh, last week, we had our first golf tournament in a couple of years over at uh, Prairie Bluff. The weather couldn't have been better. Um, we had 105 people in attendance, which is even pre-COVID, that's better than some of our pre-COVID wow. numbers, which is good. Right. We raised a little over $16,000 for the foundation, which was awesome. Um, so you know that, that went very well, and the whole structure of the Park District did a great job, the staff. And I, I love it when all the uh, scholarship recipients Were there? come in their yes. shirts based mm -hmm. on the schools they're going to, yes. which I like that. So. It was great. Um, and so in addition to that, uh, we facilitated a donation to the 100-plus Women Who Care in uh, Will County and to the LTHS Best Buddies program for $6,300. Um, the foundation also gave a $18,000 check to the school uh, here to use for Digital Creation Studio. That will be part of the MIS rebuild that is under construction now. Um, this will be used for equipment for a TV and a podcast studio, which I think is a great idea. Um, the, the money was uh, made possible. Sitco gave us a $9,000 grant. Uh, DLA Architects, who seems they're always uh, supporting our causes, gave a $4,000 check, and the foundation matched DLAs with another $4,000. Oh, that is good. So we did that, okay. and uh, Frankie Hatley <coughs> is uh, voting as a new member. Mm. Uh, so we have her, and uh, so we ended the uh, year was tough to start, but it ended very strong. That's good. I'm glad. All right, thank you. All right, uh, legislative report. Uh, busy, busy times in Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, not a comprehensive list. There have been so many uh, bills that have landed on the governor's desk. Uh, these are bills of note that landed on the governor's desk. As of sending this to you last week, they had not yet been signed. So I don't think these have been signed, but usually when they pa pass both uh, House and Senate, they will be signed. Probably the most significant uh, bill that I've been sharing with you that did get signed by the governor, um, we are actually, we expected to get signed by the governor, is the uh, legislation to extend the age for our special education transition students to 23. Um, so we're already planning along those lines to meet the needs because we'll have an increased capacity due to students who would have aged out this year mm -hmm. who will not age out, will stay with us. Um, so we're going to be doing some leasing of property um, where we'll, we'll have classrooms off site so that we can accommodate an increased population. And um, I think that that law is here to stay and to stay for a while. 
Um, and we've got some immediate planning that we're doing with that right now, but we'll have some planning that we're going to have to do in the future. That population will grow and do the good work of Dr. Huntington. Our program is very attractive, and the spotlighting that uh, Mrs. Wheeler did in a, in a great video and on Fox TV about a partnership uh, with Second City Greens, um, you know, only going to grow. Just a few things of note to share with the board. These are not signed, but I anticipate them being signed. One significant one is a change in evaluation that would change um, a teacher whose performance is rated excellent or proficient would, would shift to only being evaluated every three years, not every two years, if signed. So that's passed both. Uh, presently, we evaluate teachers every two years. These are uh, tenured teachers. This would shift to every three years. Um, significant um, sex education, having to include now sexting, um, so an affirmative standard to uh, educate students on sexing. Um, the board I've shared with you in your update, working with uh, um, retired detective Rich Wistocki, a national expert on cyber crime, on um, cyber surveillance. So this law bolsters that, trying to provide parents, staff, students with number one, education, but when those issues come up, proper um, investigation of those things. Um, in addition to Aaron's law, which is a law in, uh, that's become really an almost a national law, adopted first in Illinois, that uh, protects uh, underage uh, students, underage children from abuse. And this adds grooming, um, uh, a definition of grooming and grooming behaviors to the kind of protection that um, is included in preventing minors from uh, abuse. Uh, interesting, uh, this is in, in my high school principal days, uh, quite, quite a battle here in the state of Illinois and, and, and uh, hairstyles. Uh, hairstyles is being eliminated from dress codes. Um, there was a period of time where, where one saw quite a bit of um, uh, dress code in the state of Illinois that referred to um, a certain uh, headwear that students would wear as a, as a hairstyle. Uh, braiding as a hairstyle, both in athletics and in, in schools, and now um, uh, dress policy shall not apply to hairstyles, including hairstyles historically associated with race, race ethnicity, or hair texture. Um, and then if, an interesting thing, uh, trauma-informed school board, um, it would add, oh, I'll okay, grab your question in a second, Zion. Uh, it would add in your training if signed that school board members would have to, uh, you know, you have you know trainings that you have to take uh, through Illinois Association of School Boards. You would also have to take training in what's called trauma informed practices. Yes, I. So you said hairstyles only based on race and ethnicity. Primarily, um, the way that the the passage reads is that uh, provides it a school uniform or dress code policy adopted by a school board or local school mm -hmm. council shall not include or apply to hairstyles, including hairstyles historically associated with race, ethnicity, or hair texture. So in the general sense, it's hairstyles in general. Uh, and in my 32 years, I've seen everything. I've seen um, mohawks. I've seen uh, yeah. dress codes that prohibit kids from wearing mohawks. I've seen dress codes in my time that have prohibited dyeing one's hair. So dyeing um, and mohawks are now legal. It's, yeah, in essence, you cannot have a dress code in the state if signed by the governor that um, punishes, disallows uh, hairstyle. Cool. Um, also, just of note, you know, eventually important to us, uh, both at the federal and state levels, Juneteenth mm -hmm. has been declared a holiday, um, noting the end of slavery in the United States, uh, the official end of slavery, the practice. Um, and so we'll be working, Mr. Kandari will be working to add that to our, you know, list. And it is a, a, a non-day uh, mm -hmm. at the federal and state level if it falls on a weekday. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions about legislation? It's been very busy in Springfield. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Um, also, just one, I'm going to talk about it in my superintendent report. But we are navigating the school world of phase five. <laughs> and I'll talk about that in my... Um, report um, and there's a document that I shared with board members that I'll reference in my report as well uh, sharing with people in here for example uh, in a setting like this we're in a school so in the hallways of the school ISBE and IDPH is asking all of us to wear a mask 
So when we step outside of this door, uh, right now, currently, uh, to mask. Inside a meeting, the protocol here is you may unmask if you're vaccinated, but you must be six feet apart if you don't have a mask. Uh, you should mask if you are not vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated and you're just uncomfortable and you want to wear a mask, wear your mask. Um, so you can see what we're trying to navigate here in this phase five uh, time right now. So you have to take people for their word that they did get vaccinated? You, you really do. You know, we're not asking for vaccination cards as people walk into a board meeting. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little, maybe a little bit more about that in my superintendent report. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McBride. You bet. All right, communications. We received two notes of thanks, the first one being from Dawn Bishop. She said, thank you for 30 years of Lackford Township High School memories. Um, this is a recently retired teacher. Mm -hmm. She was the LTHS class of 1974 um, and class of 2021 retirees <laughs> is what she wrote. And then the other one is from the District Council 205 membership, um, just as a thank you for our continued support while navigating the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. All right. There are no freedom of information requests. All right. Comments on the agenda. A designated portion of the board meeting is set aside to hear comments on topics listed on the agenda. A person wishing to speak must sign in and provide all information requested on the sign-in sheet, including the agenda item they will be addressing. The board president will call speakers up by name, announcing their time to comment. A time limit of five minutes per speaker per agenda topic will be imposed. The purpose of requesting such information on the sign-in sheet is to obtain the correct spelling of the name of the speaker and contact information which will be used for any necessary board follow-up and we have um let's see a miss andrea Baumhart. Okay. all right okay you can yeah and if you could just uh, the, for the public comment if you could use the table just the table it, it helps yeah. with the mic uh to pick up for the the live stream that we're still doing at home. okay all right and i'm gonna i'm gonna have our vice president dick guides uh keep up he's going to be my timekeeper so okay. okay is the microphone on mm -hmm. yeah. can you hear me yes hear okay hi right. hi Hello. Um, my name is andrea Baumhart, and i want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening i really appreciate it um i've been a teacher here at lockport um serving as a teacher for 23 years and it's been a great place to work um i've been you know watching a bunch of school board meetings happening over the last couple weeks in um, Illinois. And um, it's come to my attention that um, ISBE has some guidelines that they would like to put out for students and staff at Illinois schools. And, um, you know, I, I was reading the guidelines and they are really sitting heavy on my heart. And um, I, I decided that I was going to walk into the valley unafraid today. And um, I just wanted to say a few things. And I, I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm not here to offend anybody, truly. I just wanted to you know, share some thoughts um, that I have regarding these guidelines that I've read about and um, you know, I've, I've read that students and staff at schools will be asked to be vaccinated by some schools and um, that this is going to be a school by school basis. Um, I've read that weekly testing may also be happening for unvaccinated students and staff. And I was thinking about those things. And um, I, as a teacher, um, I have concerns. I have some real concerns about, you know, how this is going to affect students and staff mentally. Um, I am concerned that this could lead to uh, shaming 
in some regard. I've seen public figures in the media shame people for not being vaccinated and um, I wonder how that could make students feel if they were, you know, just one or a couple kids that were, you know, masked in class, but everybody else was not, how they might feel about that internally, how they would feel about that, how they would process that. Um, I really think that that should be left up to families as a family decision. Um, those are really hard decisions to make. And um, people don't People don't take those decisions lightly. I know they really think about them um, and what's best for their families. And um, regarding the vaccine itself, um, I, again, it's, it's very much still controversial in our country and our country is very divided. And um, I don't want to see anybody discriminated against for choices that they would make um, regarding their own health care. And um, I could name at least five or six different reasons why an adult or a teenager would choose not to be vaccinated. I can understand why parents might be leery about it. And, um, you know, just some things that I thought might be helpful to consider, and um, maybe they would resonate with you, but but maybe they wouldn't. I don't know, but I. It's a very important topic that you have on that. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, um, I just think that um, for our community, I would hope that, and I know I know you're going to be having these conversations. I know you're going to be talking about them. Um, Please consider our school community, our students, and our staff with the utmost compassion when you make these decisions so that people don't feel that um, they're backed into a corner or that they are being discriminated against or shamed into making decisions about their own health care. Thank you. Next, we have a Mr. Ryan Johnson. Mr. Johnson, I'm also going to have Mr. Dick Ives mm -hmm. be my timekeeper. It's okay. Sure. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Ryan Johnson. Uh, I have three kids. Two are here at Lockport High School and one in Hadley. Uh, I'm here to talk about the same thing, uh, the proposal next year for unvaccinated students to continue to wear masks and submit to weekly testing. Uh, first, uh, I'm not going to refer to it as a vaccine because it is not. it does not function like a traditional vaccine. Uh, this is experimental, it's emergency use, and it's mRNA gene therapy, and not expected to be fully approved until 2023. Uh, we're also talking about a proposal to an age group that is mostly unaffected by this virus and has a 99.998% survival rate of getting it. This proposal, which only applies to unvaccinated students, would lead you to believe that for the vaccinated students, the shot will guarantee you don't get the virus or transmit it to other people. I'm sure we've all read the stories and known people who continue to test positive after receiving the shot. Recently in Massachusetts, 4,000 people who tested positive all had the shot. People might say, well, that might be true, but it reduces the severity and the duration, making it less likely you'll pass it on, especially to the vulnerable populations. The opposite will happen. You take healthy people, whether it's teenagers or their parents, and let's assume they don't get the shot. They get the virus, it kicks their butt for a few days, they stay in bed and they stay away from people. That seems ideal in how any other illness or virus would be handled. Now you take a shot that might lessen the severity. Overall, they feel fine. Maybe you're a little tired, but you keep going around with your life, visiting grandma and grandpa. This seems like a much more serious problem. Um, but now to the adverse reactions. There have been more deaths associated with the shot than with all other vaccines in the past 30 years combined. More and more cases of heart inflammation, especially in teenage boys and other severe and often silenced reporting of other adverse reactions, including paralysis and blood clotting. Again, all this for a virus with a 99% plus survival rate. What risk are we trying to mitigate? Most recently, four British Airway pilots, all middle-aged and healthy, all vaccinated and all died within days of each other. But the media and the airline says there's nothing to see here. 
Masks, they don't work. Many masks will say on the side of the box it's not meant to contain viruses. I always like the analogy of thinking that a chain link fence will keep out mosquitoes. Then the health detriments of not getting full oxygen, sitting in a bacteria ridden mask all day, the nausea, headaches, and lack of concentration. The tests itself are also questionable. The maker of the test has gone on record and said this is a very unreliable test and not what it was meant for. And who's making money on these tests? But I won't go into that here. Also, and very important, we need to stop with the ridiculous quarantine rules. With all the students that ended up quarantined last year, how many turned out to have a positive test case? I would imagine none. Never in history have we quarantined healthy children. They also lose two weeks of their education for each instance, since ISBE wants to offer no remote options to kids quarantined that did not take the vaccine but who had the option. This is absolutely disgusting. Many listening on the call here may have been uh, here a few weeks ago on a beautiful Friday night for eighth grade graduation. Almost all of the parents enjoyed the ceremony without masks in the audience. But the school made 425 eighth grade graduates sit there outside in masks while distanced during such a happy event in their lives. Now I am glad these students got to experience a real graduation and I do give the school credit for that, but it's absolutely criminal the junior high admin make them cover their beautiful faces. All the masks came right off when it was over and they were taking pictures together. So again, what are we doing and what are we trying to stop? What do you think happens outside of the classroom in school? These kids are maskless during their sports. Many of us are in travel sports and close contact, hanging out, sleepovers, pool parties. A lot of us are taking our kids to Cubs and Sox games this summer in stadiums now going to full capacity and no masks. Thank you. So our kids will look up to us and say, did our parents fight for us? Did our teachers and administrators fight for us? And I hope we can say we did. I applaud professional athletes like Cole Beasley for the Bills, pushing back against the NFL mandate on these shots. He said he would rather retire than be forced to take an experimental injection. But as a more senior player who can comfortably retire, says he's also doing this as a voice for the younger players. Wrapping up, I implore this school administration to make the right decision and go fully mask optional without testing next year. If you've signed contracts with testing companies, cancel them. I hope it won't get this far, but I'm not afraid to take legal action if necessary. I would think either between violations of civil liberties, violations of HIPAA, violations of the Nuremberg Code, or some combination of the three, myself or a group of parents would be successful. But again, I hope it doesn't come to that. All we're asking is for medical freedom and personal choice. These kids have suffered enough the last 15 months and carried a burden they were not meant to carry. Stop this now, unmask these kids, and stop with the medical tyranny. And don't tell me your hands are tied by Pritzker or IDPH. Thank you. Just need a motion for the approval of the regular meeting minutes and the approval of the closed session meeting minutes of May 17, 2021. Second. Been motioned by Mr. Ives and second by Dr. Shaw to approve the regular meeting minutes and the closed session meeting minutes of May 17th, 2021. <coughs> Are there any questions to those minutes? All right, hearing none, roll call. Johnson? Yes. Navarra? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Travis? Same. Lewandowski? Same. Ives? Yes. Lopez Caneva? Yes. Thank you. Next, we have the approval of our treasurer's report for May 2021. Need a motion for that? So moved. Second. Again, it's been motioned by Mr. Ives and second by Dr. Shaw. Are there any questions to that? There's only one comment. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to jump in front of your uh, vote. I just want to draw. Um, board members' attention to a very important document that Mrs. Croy will include uh, this month, next month, and the next month as we get into budget season. And that's the five-year financial projection. Um, and I know you're, you're used to when you yeah. see the, the bills payable and the treasurer's report, you know, long lists mm -hmm. and columns and numbers. Uh, but uh, this is a very important textual document that helps give you a sense of what our finances are looking like uh, five years out. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look five years out, you might be drawn um, in 2025 to a 1.25 million uh, dollar deficit, and that's a deficit that that we would have to manage. That deficit exists, um, 
based on our commitments to building and operations projects. Mm -hmm. And so the board would, for example, have to decide, uh, do we sideline those operation projects to avoid that deficit? Do we go into fund balances to fund those uh, operations projects to avoid a deficit? Do we do some kind of financing? Do we just go into a deficit? Um, so it's an important document that we're going to refer to more in July. We'll refer to it uh, certainly in August, but gives a sense of what the impact of everything that are the, the knowns and the mm -hmm. unknowns <laughs> that we can uh, determine you know, at, at this time. But a, a really important document and a great job by Mrs. Croy. So I just want to draw your attention to it. Um, so. Uh, Carry on, continue. All right. Okay, it's already been motioned and second. And only no questions then? No further questions? Okay, roll call. Travis? Same. Ives? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Lewandowski? Same. Shaw? Yes. Navarro? Uh, abstain. Lopez Caniva? Yes. Thank you. All right, now moving on to your superintendent update. Yeah, you bet. Well, there is a lot going on looking on the horizon. There's a lot going on and there's not a lot going on looking looking on the horizon. But before we do that, you know, I think um, we, we do have to get busy thinking about August 2021. But before we sort of move forward with that, um, I just think it, it's important to acknowledge some successes from, from this year. And, and I would invite everyone. You know, when, when we, you know, I know the board weekly, I've updated you nationally, Will County, our zip codes, and I would just ask everyone to reflect what's brought us to this point um, where our, our COVID-19 numbers in this nation, in our county, in our zip codes are just at a place where we can do what we're doing right now, where, where, where we're unmasked. And I think just everybody has to make up her or his own decision about how did we get to this point? Um, uh, one, I want to celebrate some great partnerships outside of our district. Uh, and, and three, many people partnered with us, but three really important partnerships. Uh, police, um, the police uh, were just so instrumental on uh, April 12th when we moved into uh, full all-in uh, learning. We could not have done it without them. Uh, the fire, uh, Lockport Township uh, fire, uh, a great partnership by really leading the way and running as many vaccination clinics <coughs> as they did. And as you know, we're partnering with Will County right now to provide that. And then an unlikely partner, but, but an amazing partner, Walmart. Uh, without Walmart really giving up about 200 parking spots in their uh, lot, uh, no charge to us, no charge to students, uh, for about you know six weeks, we would not have been able to do uh, what we did. So we're very grateful that they allowed us to to disrupt their parking lot and their, their operations. You know, uh, at the beginning, last year in July, we said we had a couple priorities, uh, safety, equity, learning, flexibility, and communication. I just wanna point out a few things. Safety, um, to me it is amazing, you know, if we uh, talked about almost 5,000 human beings coming into our district, uh, coming in and out, you know, that's called a town. And um, our, our transmission rate, our infection rate, we had seven person-to-person -person, um, transmissions. Um, our positivity rate staying as low as it did, that's just an incredible testament. We had no one hospitalized in our district. Uh, we certainly had no fatalities, um, as, as did happen, unfortunately, in, in, in some uh, school districts. That's, that's something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Pe people stayed safe. Um, and, and this was long before vaccinations. We, we were keeping people safe. Um, equity, and equity was all about making sure that through this, students had access uh, to education. We went from eight teachers in February who uh, could teach remotely to 274 teachers who can now teach remotely. That's a sea change in any profession overnight that, that is just absolutely amazing. Um, and then also the idea that we would provide time outside of the classroom. Last year was Porter Assistance and Connection Time. You'll hear more about um, some other components of that coming up. Uh, <coughs> learning, you'll hear about grades and attendance this year. You know our attendance rate was very high when we were in person. You'll hear about grades. Uh, never before did our staff 
really realize that, that teaching is actually not a solo act. You really should be doing it in partnership with a team. And that became just so apparent, um, so much so that when we negotiated uh, this year, it was very valuable um, to our teachers that they had time to meet a, 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 as teams. And, and amazing, I think you know, we, we had an expansive last summer and into the year athletics and activities mm -hmm. uh, program, which is all about a kind of learning too. Flexibility really should celebrate our human resources, providing apex to students who needed a full-time uh, remote learning option, uh, vaccination clinics and vaccinating all of our uh, staff, providing that option for them if they sought to, to take it, facilities, op operations. And um, oftentimes we heard that desire all of us had for consistency, but it was not a year you could be consistent. And I am proud that at, at, at critical junctures, when we needed to shift into different learning modes to keep learning and equity going, despite the pandemic, we, we were able to do that. And then finally, just communication. Probably the most frequent comment we get is um, from folks who just feel that communication is steady, clear, transparent, even when they didn't agree with the communication. Uh, they felt like they were receiving a pretty steady, steady diet. Um, that is not to say we're perfect by any stretch of imagination. Uh, certainly many things we learned from and certainly many things that we did not do as well as we would have liked to. Uh, but I just think it, it was an amazing year but it was a year that, that I'm pretty proud of for our staff, our students, our parents to, to, to weather it. Um, a few things in my superintendent report uh, as we really pivot towards August 2021. Um, first, just want to share with you ISBE, IDPH, and gubernatorial directives. In your folder, there is a letter that um, one of the organizations we belong to, the High School District Organization of Illinois, has written. Um, it's a draft, so there are just a few typos. It's getting cleaned up. We plan on sending it. Where what we're requesting as superintendents is clearer and better guidance. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think this board knows that uh, many industries are regulated, and we're one of the most highly regulated industries. And uh, we're regulated uh, by state constitution, by the Illinois State Board of Education, Illinois Department of Public Health. And so uh, for many reasons, um, legal reasons, liability reasons, those are the guidelines that we do have to follow. Um, the state is putting a strong emphasis right now on full in-person learning. Um, they are limiting the definition of who qualifies for remote learning. We'll have to come back to that, that later. Um, the state is strongly recommending vaccination, but I do wanna be clear that uh, we have not talked as a board I cannot believe that we'll see the state mandate vaccines. Um, so there isn't a conversation on the state level, on the public health level, or on this board of, of mandating vaccinations. That certainly wasn't what we did with um, uh, our, our, our staff, and that's not really what's in line in, uh, uh, for students uh, either. Um, the state is strongly recommending uh, COVID-19 testing protocols and um, incentivizing that because, as you know, when we were, uh, went to three feet separation, uh, we had another set of regulations that for close contact, if, it was, if you were within six feet of a positive person, uh, you had to quarantine. And what that led to is about five to 7% from April 12th to May 26th of our students having to quarantine for 14 days. That's where we're looking for some better, better guidance. If we have a testing protocol, then we are able to be at three feet um, and not, not, not worry about that 14-day uh, quarantine for students. Um, presently, uh, looking into the year, there is a man mask mandate for everyone. And that's everybody, vaccinated or unvaccinated. That's where the state is right now, that everybody's wearing masks. And there are obvious concerns about that and questions about that. Uh, that's one reason why you'll see in the letter we want some clarity uh, uh, about that because that can lead to you know all sorts of things and you know in terms of uh, are we collecting COVID cards what what is happening in the relationship uh, there but right now the the plan in the proclamation that you'll probably hear on June 27th is that everybody in the schoolhouse vaccinated or unvaccinated will wear masks um, kind of pivoting to shield testing um, we have signed a contract with, with uh, SHIELD, and just to remind the board, this is of the University of Illinois right now, probably the world's best COVID-19 test. It kept 
the positivity rate below 1% in a 60,000 uh, person um, campus a uh, whole year, if you know anyone mm -hmm. who participated in that. Uh, it detects COVID within two to three days, and most significantly, it's the only test with the sensitivity that allows a student who tests negative for COVID to return to the classroom and not be quarantined. It also allows us to put our desks uh, closer um, than, than six feet to the three feet uh, distance as well. Um, SHIELD recommends, uh, depending on the positivity rate, that unvaccinated students are tested once a week um, is the protocol. We're gonna test it this summer with some of our, our, our summer camps. Um, so it's highly sensitive and the SHIELD staff, the cost is, is borne by the, the SHIELD staff. It's SHIELD staff that do the testing, the collecting, and um, the reporting to us. Uh, then just important changes, and then kind of one of the most important changes we're gonna hear from Mrs. Cristofero and um, Dr. Huntington, who are gonna um, assist me with my superintendent report. Uh, but there's a draft of a proposed schedule for next year, where what we wanna do is take some of the lessons that we learned this year, two important lessons. One, the need for students to have time outside of class to access their teachers. But just a simple idea. Almost every teacher who ever taught class uh, ends the class saying, gosh, I just wish I had a few more minutes with that class or some students. And almost every student who's ever taken a class has walked out of a class saying, I wish I had 10 more minutes with my teacher. We found that this year when we had that kind of time built into our schedule, it was a powerful engine. And we believe, and district management group agrees, that it's probably one of the reasons why you see the kind of grade results that we have. So bringing that into four days a week uh, right after period two. And then consolidating on Wednesdays the team time that became so valuable for teachers to work together to build a cohesive system approach to learning and to curriculum and to teaching as opposed to an idiosyncratic, entrepreneurial, sort of every teacher or him or herself uh, approach um, to, to learning and to teaching. Those are the two features where you'd see a late arrival every Wednesday with school starting at about 9.45. Let me pause there because uh, I do want to share with you via Dr. Huntington and Mrs. Christophero. Um, as we were doing all of this, you might recall last year we commissioned district management group to come in and take a comprehensive look at our district uh, uh, on how do we help students who struggle. And, and believe me, sometimes we have a mythology that you know AP students, honor students, A students, they don't struggle. I would say all high school students struggle. At one point or another, if you're not struggling, you're probably not learning. So how do we help students when they struggle? in our district. But let me just pause there on, on things I've shared so far before we, we bring them out for a little longer superintendent report. Any questions about the schedule, shield testing? Um, we're right now looking, I would say, um, for most superintendents, we, we are uh, somewhat <laughs> frustrated by, by what we haven't received from ISBE. And so we're looking for clearer and better guidance from them. Question about shield testing. Is it considered a rapid test? The it is a rapid okay. test. It's, it's a rapid test only in the sense that because um, there's a second party that has to take it to a lab that has to test it, um, you usually get the results about uh, 24 hours later. So it's a saliva test. All right. Milo. Okay. Yeah, we don't usually, Mr. Johnson, take questions um, uh, during the board meeting. So, and we'll we'll talk later after you know your. Um, I'll follow up with you uh, on your on your comments. Okay. Um, any questions from the board? Okay, Dr. Huntington and Mrs. Cristofero. <coughs> so, as they come up, you might recall that district management group spent quite a bit of time, and I think. Um, I'm including this in my superintendent report because I think what is in this report is so significant to the future of our district. It really almost operates like a strategic plan or a blueprint from an independent organization looking in on our district. Take it away. Good evening. Thank you very much for this time. Um, I don't know, I know some of you were a part of our um, focus groups when we were doing um, this um, study with DMG Group, so I, I thank you for those of you who had participated in it, and for the rest of you, we're going to share the results that we received from DMG. 
Just really quickly, I wanted to review kind of our process. You know that we started this in October of 2020. Um, you can see all the little things that we did along the line and today we are kind of here at the develop the district priority um, from the findings area um, again the methodology or the methodology that was used was qualitative evidence with data analysis so lots of conversations with lots of different people as well as looking at um, a lot of data that um, we uh, well, I'm going to give Lori the props on there pulled from a lot of different areas. So they took those data and the qualitative evidence and were able to um, provide some of these findings. So these were the four areas of strength. We talked about that with you guys last time, so I'm not gonna uh, go over those again. You know that we have lots of great things happening here at Lockport. What we do want to do is talk to you about the four opportunities that DMG brought forward from their result. And I'm going to start with Lori. Um, next, slide. next slide. Yeah. Yes. So one of the first recommendations that they made was this, uh, ensure that general education teachers are well equipped to differentiate for all students in the classroom. And how did they come up with this? Well, let's look at the next slide. Um, you can click again, Matt, there should be. Yeah, so you can see through their data analysis that most struggling students spend the majority of their day with the classroom teacher. That's uh, probably not mind-blowing for anybody here, but that's where they are at. And so the question becomes, how does this classroom teacher provide support for all the different kinds of students they see sitting in front of them? So you, Matt, you can click through it. Yeah, you've seen this before, this response to intervention model, and you're gonna hear us talk a lot about it. It's not just three tiers, it's really this idea of a multi-tiered. How can we support students when they're struggling? Going back one more. <laughs> but really, you can see here, the idea is that we're helping most of the students in the classroom with the, with the classroom teacher, the gen ed teacher. So, go on. Um, so this is again some data that they pulled for us and looked at and you can see that students um, who have IEPs, that means they receive special education supports or students with low income backgrounds or students with limited English uh, proficiency are more likely to have grades that are C or below. And so how do we help teachers work to, here's this word again, differentiate in their classroom? So really, teachers can differentiate in three ways. They can differentiate through process, product, or content. What does that mean? If you're giving a reading assignment, right, the teacher could choose to have the, everybody reads the exact same thing. Or they could choose, I'm going to scale this differently for different levels of readers. Or they might use some auditory pieces to help the students with their understanding, right, like an audio book. So that is something about process. Um, something about um, product. A teacher could say, I need to see that you understand how this primary source we're looking at, the Declaration of Independence. A teacher could say, you can show that to me through a written response, or you can show that to me through drawing a picture or political cartoon, or you can write a song, right? So there's, that is something about the product. So these are ways that teachers do this, and they have to be, it can't happen every single class period, every single day. Be, because they have such diverse learners in front of them. So they have to be really strategic, very deliberate about choosing when to differentiate and how they're gonna differentiate for their students in front of them. And so we can see here, this layers in some of the work that we're already doing. Part of that is working with their PLC teams, with, which Dr. McBride spoke about earlier. Really working with those teams and discussing instructional strategies they're using, and also we can layer in some additional PD support for teachers. But I also wanna talk about the second bulleted item, which is also something that we're working on implementing for this school year. You can go to the next slide, Matt. So one of the things we can do to help teachers with um, shifting some practices, learning some new practices, is having coaches. And this tells you about the effectiveness of coaches. So just like coaching a sport, if I'm coaching a basketball team and I identify there's something that my team's weak at, maybe they're weak <coughs> at making layups, 
I'm going to think of a strategy. We're going to practice that strategy. Then we're going to do it in the game. Then we're going to reflect on how did it go. Very similar when you're working with teachers. You look at what, what's not going well or what do we need to help you with. Um, maybe it's that students need help with reading for inference. What might be some strategies to help the students in your content area really understand reading for inference? And then coming up, planning, doing some resources, putting it in, and then reflecting on it. And so because you can see right here, if I was just going to lecture to teachers about here's how you teach inference to a whole group of teachers, you can see probably less than 5% of teachers would go back and have a successful experience with it. But with coaching, right, it has a dramatic impact. This is a slide from DMG, really well resourced, because coaching for the teacher, it's job embedded. It's in the moment. It's professional development, so it's layered in. And so we have three staff members that will be working on literacy coaching for this year, really helping teachers develop some more literacy skills to help those diverse learners in their classroom. So how would they do what? Coach the teacher. So in the moment. In the mo we're going to meet together probably outside of class, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about what you see going on with your students. I mean, so I you would observe what the teacher's doing. Um, or the teacher's going to come to them and say, "My kids are not picking up on inference skills. What are some strategies that you can share with me that I could use?" Or I remember <coughs> what actually happened to me. Um, I was teaching an AP class, and my students read a portion of the textbook. And they did not know what the main ideas were because it was a different kind of writing. So I worked with a coach. Coaches are generally really good at questioning to help the teacher discover what is it that they need to do. And then talking about strategies together to come up with best, some best practice for the students in the classroom. Thank you for that question. So now I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the strengthening and systematizing supports for struggling learners. This is an area that um, I um, want to really kind of stress is not something that's going to happen overnight, right? This is kind of the meat of, of what we're going to need to kind of look at and make some determinations and determine how we can support our learners. So when we look at best practices for that MTSS system, um, one piece that um, DMG can you go back one? Oh. One piece that DMG talked to us um, a lot about was this organization and the structure. So how are we going to be able to put a system in place that allows teachers, students, counselors, parents, anybody that has access to a student and a struggling student, what do we do? Right? What's the next step? How do I know where I'm going? And so when we look at and we talk to several teachers and several um, uh, other groups in our focus group, one thing that we learned was everybody kind of was looking at each other like, who? Who's the person that we go to when this kid is having a trouble, right? Whether it's math or science or social emotional. And so one of the things that we looked at is that organizational and structure piece. And, and we feel that our guidance counselors are perfectly situated to be that who, that person that's going to be the linchpin, right? These are the reports that I'm getting. This is what's happening. I can see everything in different areas and I can push in and provide and direct um, supports and services. So we really feel that, next slide, that we have a lot of things going on for, to support our struggling students. But depending on who you're talking to, they might not know, oh, I can put that student in a code talk class. Or, oh, this person really needs to be connected with their Porter assistance time. So there's this kind of moving around, trying to figure out navigating the system. And, and that's got to be something that we need to look at and address. So we want to make sure that we're looking at those interventions and making sure that they're solid and that we can take data to see if those interventions are being successful for students or if they're not, what's next? Next slide. OK. So these are our steps. These are very kind of nicely outlined steps for us to take. And as you can see, there's a lot. It seems like a couple bullet points, but there's a lot of detail in those bullet points. 
And so um, as Lori and I have been discussing and, and through our use of our PLCs, um, we really feel like, you know, we've got to get that organization and structure together and then um, line up those other things, data and assessment and, and the implementation and supports as we go through. So we can make sure that we're implementing a, an MTSS system with fidelity. And again, this is a timely process. This is not going to be up and running next year. We're going to, you know, need to make sure that we're strategically planning to implement these supports and services. So. Again, future considerations, this kind of outlines more of that other slide that we talked a little bit about, about how we can look at and, and things that we're doing. You know, I mean, one of those things, when you have built in time during the school day, you're gonna be able to help a lot of students. And so that's one of their suggestions as well. So I'm gonna to continue to speak. Um, the next area is just to make sure that we're matching those student needs with um, the staff that have the expertise. Um, and so we do, we have math and reading specialists that we utilize and we have special education and inclusion teachers and we have ELL teachers. And how are we making sure that we're taking these specialists and we are maximizing their impact on students? So we need to look at what kind of training and support that these teachers need. So we're looking at, uh, you know, and adding PD for teachers, both general ed, special ed, and ELL teachers to ensure that we have content area experts and learning experts that can work with students that are struggling moving into those tier two plus and three um, levels. And that's just some more. <laughs> I know I won't read it to you. <laughs> All right, here is their uh, fourth recommendation, provide proactive, consistent, and systematic social, emotional, and behavioral support. Um, that's a lot. Again, where's their data coming from on this? Well, first of all, it's coming from what we know students are coming to school with this year is very different than what any of us ever experienced in our schooling. And um, next slide, please. We know from national norms about um, mental health related hospitalizations. Dr. McBride has talked regularly at the board meeting and updated you all when the mental health facilities for teens were full in this area during the pandemic on several occasions. Um, oh, you went too fast. <laughs> um, and so SEL, the need for this has increased the importance during this time. So I want to take a second and just explain what is social emotional learning? Because sometimes people think social emotional learning and mental health, these things are the same, but they're not. They're almost like they're on a spectrum. And the hope is that if we help students get better with social emotional learning, we might intervene before a crisis occurs. So we focus on SEL, on things like self-awareness, which is things like identifying your emotions, um, recognizing your strengths, uh, self-management, which could be prioritizing, organizing. So even right now in this moment, uh, you could sit here and think, how am I feeling right now in the board meeting? Am I really engaged and interested? And why am I feeling that way? Or am I feeling angry and frustrated? Why am I feeling that way? And that's really what we wanna help students be aware of in the moment. How can I set myself up for less stress by managing myself better? And how can I be aware of, of my emotions and maybe go to an adult for help if I recognize that something is, it seems not to be on. So the benefits of social emotional learning, which again, uh, our classroom teachers need to be ready to talk about self-management in the classroom. And I bet Ms. Baumhart does it as students enter the room. She probably tells them what they're gonna do for the day to really get them set in that moment. Um, but the benefits are overall improved relationships academic performance will improve, decline in anxiety. So that's why we engage in this work. But also that work and that um, item that they said, here's an opportunity for you really to grow and help your students, circles back to something Angela was talking about. So as you can see, this is a beautiful little uh, graphic here that DMG gave us. It's a, a puzzle, right? So we have all these great pieces that are kind of out there doing their thing. How are we gonna put those pieces together in order to make sure that we are creating that comprehensive MTSS system? 
again, a process that will take some time. We've been um, super fortunate. Our PE department has been way ahead of the curve, and now we need to get that same language in a lot of our other classrooms as well. So that professional development piece as part of an MTSS system is our next role. And as you can see, you know, we have some of these things partially in place already. So we're, we're in a good, good place. We just gotta make it, formalize it, and, and systematize it. And, and so we said, again, we keep saying this, that this will take time. Um, as well as we want to take care of the social emotional well-being of our students, we want to take care of our staff, social emotional well-being, and really consider what, where we're going next year, and then where will we go the year after that, and the year after that, as we work to build this system. So on the next slide, there are four questions that we posed here for the board. Um, you can read them. I'm not going to ask you to answer them all. And in fact, I'm going to give you some think time, too. So I'd love for you to pick out maybe one of the questions that you might be willing to respond here or two. Um, go ahead. Do you have a timetable? You said that this would take time. So I was wondering if you guys had like a plan, like a, a timetable specifically. It's a, it's a great question. It's a similar process to a strategic plan process. So we would be hopeful that we would be moving through setting systems up, what were you saying, three to four year kind of timeline um, as we build um, different capacities where we could say, this is it, this is our system. We're not gonna wait three or four years to implement things, but we're gonna be looking at how we can support and structure things. We can't train every teacher and every SEL activity in, in a month's time. So it does take time over. Um, have it written down, like somewhere, so that I can like see it in more detail as to what the you know, time table would be. I love a good manual. <laughs> I do. Um, and, and that's our hope is to be able to be able to provide these materials and supports for anybody who walks into the room. Um, but as far as do we have a start to finish outline, not yet. That's part of the planning process. Okay. And that's what I would say. So we'll come back to these questions. We actually put them on a last slide, but if there's anything that's really you want to push forward with. But we did want to share with you, and, and, and this is really taking these recommendations. So we just got them in May, right? And they were presented to our guiding coalition. And so it's really now the work of the guiding coalition to start thinking of that plan that Mr. Navarro is talking about, right? Like, what does this look like in one year? What are we going after? What can we work on? What can we add on? But it's an idea of a continuous improvement cycle. I just want to point out, oh, one, sorry. One thing I would interject, a really good question about a, a, a timeline, almost a timeline that's already rolling in that, you know, the, the proposed direction of instituting, you know, two recommendations here, um, time for teachers and students to have access outside of class built into the school day um, and then also time weekly for professional learning community teams to meet but the first part about this before we start getting that whole timeline rolling out is to have an understanding with the board really this very simple thing so what really this proposes is that the focus of this district should be on struggling students mm -hmm. and really the very first thing that we should do is make sure that that's understood by the board it's supported by the board um i i would argue struggling students because what i would argue but then they just but then they just say that we can consider our most students struggling because you could have some I, ap students who i i i would and and to put a finer point on that Luann, what i would say is that specifically students by any kind of calculation who are sort of Use a measure 35th percentile to 50th percentile, D, F, right? Th that is actually the area where if we want to advance mm -hmm. our, um, our achievement, mm -hmm. um, anywhere from the SAT to college and career readiness, those are really the students whose achievement we have to work with the most. Those are the students of the great, greatest need. And the key thing here is if you go back to what DMG noted is, very high skilled teachers, very passionate, very competent, very capable, great results. But the key word in here is a system. And high schools very quickly become small tribes. Two buildings, separate programs, 10 departments, different grade levels, different um, courses in those grade levels. 
And people very quickly get into silos, but they forget that what a student really experiences is when they walk in the door, they experience a complete day. And the more disconnected their teachers might be, the more confusing their experience might be. And really what DMG is suggesting is threading those seven teachers. What do those seven teachers have in common if you're a student moving through through the day? What are the common touch points? And, and is there a common way that that each of your teachers handles you struggling, or as a student, you have to navigate the adults. You have to figure out every single teacher and their differences, which as students who struggle more and more, that becomes harder and harder for them. Um, so that's just a kind of a key, the key start off point um, that you mentioned, Zion, is you know, getting the board support for this direction, really. So sorry to interrupt you, Dr. No, Huntington. No, that's fine. Um, that you know, I was talking about um, how we use this, you know, you, we've been talking for probably 20 minutes now. The Guiding Coalition had this data and this information broken down over four hours. So there was a lot of very detailed information that they, they received that we tried <coughs> to um, give, give them that information mm -hmm. so they can start kind of helping guide um, this process because we need them to be involved as well and so we're looking at um, you know what DMG did and and what the guiding coalition um, kind of talked through and so they were all on a zoom chat and were asked this question right so we're not going to read this to you but Lori and I felt that there was one or two points um, that the guiding coalition came forward that we just wanted to highlight and mine was you know as the teachers and the staff that were on the guiding coalition were talking about one of the major things is they talked about is they're just not sure where to go with struggling students. And so that came forward with um, the, the information from the qualitative aspect of the DMG interviews. And then Lori wanted to. Um, yeah, so I think this idea of having a clear system, this NTSS system where people know what do I do next um, is so important, but it also hinges on the work of our PLC teams our teacher teams working together on that differentiation and talking about how are we gonna help these kids in the classroom? Do we go to the next level? And, and that brings up our, our, our pack time or the time in the day where the students can get extra help and how our PLC teams will be facilitating putting students into those spaces to receive the extra support that they need. So really those are key pieces of this work as we move forward. So this, um, on the uh, guiding coalition team, there were building level administrators, counselors, deans, um, the screen was on there, uh, teachers, uh, gen ed teachers, special ed teacher, who am I forgetting? Department chairs. Department yeah. chairs, so it was a, a nice cross section. So if you remember, back to our, I think we put it the last slide. Yes, we did make it the last slide. There you go. There were our questions that we wanted to ask you. Um, we've already had a couple of questions, but anybody want to respond to any of these prompts? Yeah, Mr. Ives. One of the questions, and, and I think it's always been my perception here um, as a parent and, a, and on the school board, that you know you talk about, you know, they were commenting that we didn't have the structure per se, but I. I've seen many times examples of teachers and students. You talked about, um, you know, into the coaching side of it, where okay, you have these three children, you know, three kids in, in the classroom, and they don't all learn the same way. One may need a little more time for the testing, and that was my daughter when she was here, and it was a so it was ongoing. So is is the result of what they've seen is that we don't have a big structure and individual teachers were already doing that and they want to see a more cross the board structure because mm -hmm. it's definitely was has been going on here for quite oh. some time. Number one, we have enthusiastic, capable teachers. Oh, no question. No question. Mm -hmm. But when when it comes time to a tier two, tier three interventions where we really need to wrap around services for kiddos, we're, we're not able to access that data because this teacher might have done this and this teacher might have done this and this social worker might have done this and it makes it very difficult. So we need to, to assimilate it together because it, it's happening. But you know, and then teacher A can benefit from teacher B because hey, I was already doing this and this worked for me. Right. Absolutely. 
Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's more of a structural thing. It's not like starting over. Correct. No, no not at all. Good. Not at all. Correct. Because, Matt, if you go back to that slide that, that they presented at the beginning of the strengths, you bring up a very good point, Mr. Ives, that keep, um, keep it's way at the beginning. Slide two. Uh, you bring up a really good point that the, the, the high lever is that if, if all teachers are connected along that, that, that structural, mm -hmm. so that the experience for any struggling student is a more consistent experience and less left up to the luck of I got this teacher or I got that teacher. You, you exactly hit the nail on the head of teacher A and B and C and D are speaking a similar language that's understood by each other by the student, then the system has far more efficiency, far more understanding. Um, it, it, it takes uh, it teachers like uh, Mrs. Baumhart and um, says there is a system beyond your classroom because we've given her X amount of students an X amount of time daily and she could probably share with us many times where she said, but what about beyond that? The needs of this student go beyond that. Right. Um, so what's what is beyond that? And uh, so it is not, you know, reinventing the wheel. Very good point. This is probably one of my favorite presentations so far, being on this board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like ready to jump out of my seat because I just I love every single thing about this. I because I, I think Luann and I were in the DMG question session together. Um, and I was like, where are they going to go with this? And this is just phenomenal. So I'm so excited to see what happens with this. It's a good time to acknowledge they're very modest. They're not going to say it them so themselves. But this really has been the work of Dr. Huntington and Mrs. Cristofero really all year. And also what I appreciate is so typically with DMG, it's the director of special ed. And any representation from regular education is, is really absent from the process. And it was important to you when we talked about this. You said, let's look at all struggling students. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at our most struggling students in particular because they're the most sensitive right That's to right. to a lack of a system that can be a high leverage activity and um, really back to a, a comment that Dr. Huntington made this focus is a strategy it, it's a long-term strategy to really say that we're going to judge our litmus test of our skill primarily by those students who experience the most academic difficulty um, generally, our students who are advanced placement or honors, and I'm saying this generally, um, are, are highly resourced, highly successful, have figured out schooling, and in their own way have a number of resources that we've given them as a district. Generally, students who are below the 35th percentile on any skill have a lot of resources wrapped around. But so students right in the middle at that 50th percentile that sometimes are a 50-50 proposition. They exceed state standards or grades or not, and we're trying to make that more predictable in a good way. So it's more predictable that they're going to uh, expand their skills and their achievement. It's really good. Yeah, I like this one. Hey, Stella. Stella's interesting. Yeah, Stella's interesting. Yeah, Stella's interesting. The one about classroom teaching struggling yeah, the, how the classroom teacher does spend the most time mm -hmm. with the students. And so mm -hmm. yeah. the more resources we can give those teachers to implement those strategies within their classroom, the more successful kids will be because they're with them the most of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the message here that DMG, and I, I've been part of a DMG study before, where the, the conclusion was not as... Um, enthusiastic about the teaching staff but what we're trying to exploit here is that we have a tremendous lever with right off the bat DMG has detected that we have a very strong teaching staff but not only a strong teaching teaching staff they describe them as a very committed teaching staff committed to purpose so the strategy really is to, to look first and foremost at the classroom where students spend the most amount of time and our experience has been teachers are saying Hey, hey, more, you know, help, help me. I want to do a better job. Provide me more to do that better job in my, in my classroom. Um, and we're really trying to leverage that spirit um, and that, that skill. We're excited. Very. So are we, 
We look Thank forward you. to hearing about it. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and Zion, Mr. Navarra, really, you know, the next stage will be timing this out. Mm -hmm. You know, as we get your questions, we work on this. So. Thank you for a great job. You guys did a great job steering this. Well, you know, really outstanding, great investment. All right. Oh, sorry. 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 I move to approve consent agenda items 2 through 13 as written. Second. A motion by Dr. Shaw and second by Mr. Ives to approve uh, consent agenda items number 2 to number 13. Are there any questions to any of those? Okay. Hearing none, roll call. Lewandowski? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Ives? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Navarro? Yes. Travis? Yes. Lopez Caniva? Yes. And next we need, I need a motion for the approval of salaries, fringe benefits, and work policy tier folks. I can make that motion. Second. It's been motioned by Lopez Caniva and second by Dr. Shaw to approval of salaries, fringe benefits, and work policy tier books. Are there any questions to those? To that. All right, hearing none, roll call. Ives? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Travis? Yes. Navarra? Yes. Lewandowski? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Lopez Caniva? Yes. Next, I need the approval of license administrator contracts for the 2021 2022 fiscal year. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Shaw and second by Mr. Travis. Are there any questions to that? Roll call. Johnson? Yes. Navarra? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Travis? Yes. Lewandowski? Yes. Ives? Yes. Lopez Caneva? Yes. Okay, next I need the a motion for the approval of salaries for non licensed for non licensed director salaries for the 2021 2022 fiscal year. So moved. Second. It's been motioned by Mr. Travis and second by Dr. Shaw. Are there any questions to that? All right, roll call. Shaw? Yes. Lewandowski? Yes. Ives? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Navarro? Yes. Travis? Yes. Lopez Caniva? Yes. Next, I need the approval of salaries for non-licensed employees not covered by collective bargaining agreements for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. I can make that motion. Second. Been motion by Lopez and even second by Dr. Shaw. Are there any questions to that? And hearing none, roll call. Navarra? Uh, abstain. Travis? Yes. Lewandowski? Yes. Ives? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Lopez Caniva? Yes. Mm. Mm. Next, I need the approval of the bus driver salary schedule for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been motioned by Dr. Shaw and seconded by Mr. Travis. Are there any questions to that? All right, roll call. Lewandowski? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Ives? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Navarro? Yes. Travis? Yes. Lopez Caneva. Yes. All right, next I need the approval of the miscellaneous pay rate schedule for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. So moved. And I get, um, all right, it's been motioned by Dr. Sean Tra and second by Mr. Travis. Are there any questions to that? All right, roll call. Travis? Yes. Ives? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Lewandowski? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Navarro? Uh, abstain. Lopez Caniva? Uh, yes.
Okay, next I need a motion uh, for the approval of the superintendent's contract extension. There is a, uh, a language that we have that I have to read. And it does state that the board proposes a new multi-year contract for employment for Superintendent Robert McBride. This new multi-year contract begins on July 1st, 2020, 2022, or is it should be 2021? It, the, the way they had to write it was 2021. Um, yeah, I think so. It's 2021 and expires on June 30th, 2025. It establishes a base salary of 211,680 as approved by the Board of Education in April 2021. It establishes performance goals for the superintendent. The multi-year contract indicates that the superintendent may receive salary adjustments annually at the board's discretion. It also establishes benefits for the superintendent. Just need a motion for that? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been motioned by Mr. Ives and seconded by Dr. Shaw. Are there any questions to that? All right, hearing none, roll call. Ives? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Travis? Yes. Navarro? Yes. Lewandowski? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Lopez Caneva? Yes. Congratulations, Dr. Navarro. Thank you very much. What <laughs> well, pleasure to serve you for four more years. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. I appreciate the work and, and appreciate the community and working with all of you sincerely. You know, it's hard work. All right. Policy consideration. Okay. Policy consideration. <laughs> so this is really up for oh. some discussion. This, yeah. this is a piece of um, current ISBE uh, guidance and Again, we, we don't know if this will shape shift or change. So I've shared with the board, we fully expect it on June 11th to have a comprehensive set with phase five of, of guidance. And, and actually, if you look at phase five, uh, we, we don't have much. We don't have much to go on. Um, but remote learning. So I'll just try to kind of be brief here. Um, what I'd ask board members to do is set aside homebound learning. That has not changed. Uh, Dr. Huntington does a great job, our school counselors, if a child requires homebound learning for whatever reason that the student physically, mental health wise, cannot attend school. So that stays in place under school code. That has not changed. Yeah, Mr. Um, Just to clarify, homebound learning is for people who are expected to be like at home for a majority of the school year. Right. Or, it's not intended to be like the majority of an entire school year. It's intended to be temporary. It's generally connected to uh, physical health, mental health, uh, for a duration of time. And it also, to qualify for it, has to have the appropriate documentation. That, that hasn't changed throughout the pandemic. We have an affirmative responsibility if a, a student for medical, let's just call it medical reasons, cannot attend school. And homebound is, is not intended to be a whole year. It's not intended to be multi-year. It's intended to address that particular issue at the time and the documented reason why a student can't physically be in school. So that school code has not changed one bit. Then there is school code, uh, which is um, school code basically 10-30. And 10-30, in the pandemic established remote learning for, for all learners, that we had to affirmatively have a program of remote learning for all learners. So last year, we provided full remote learning all year through APEX, or when we were in hybrid, we had um, asynchronous learning and a variety of different types of remote learning. There's a draft resolution out by the state superintendent, which the plan is to release that draft resolution likely June 27th, because that's when the current disaster proclamation expires. Many people believe that the governor will not renew the emergency disaster proclamation, and the state will announce it, its stand on August 21st. Um, part of the prediction about why we're not getting so much um, from the state right now, Chicago Public Schools have not adjourned school yet. Tomorrow is their last day of school. 10-30, uh, remote learning for all will expire. And the state has introduced that the only students under 10-30 under that would qualify for a remote learning program 
would be students who cannot qualify for a vaccination and are under a quarantine order from a local public health or state public health. But there is a third piece, 10-29 in school code, which is policy 6 colon 185, which is a policy you adopted uh, at your May meeting in 2019 which authorizes the superintendent to establish a remote learning program. You are able as a local school board to make a determination to direct me, and this is a first reading and maybe a discussion, um, to, to amend this language because there's right in the very top, and we put this in your folder for easy access, just a paper copy, it reads, the superintendent shall develop, maintain, and supervise a remote educational program consistent with Illinois ICS 510-29. The remote educational program, and here are some of the key words that are not yet defined, if we so choose to, shall provide an opportunity for qualifying students to participate in an educational program also not defined. So this board could identify qualifying students and could determine what that program is. Uh, your, your two most likely candidates would be, I believe we will have families that will come forward and say, I have a situation not in that state definition that precludes me from coming to school. Uh, a medical condition myself, a uh, medical condition in my home of an elder or a parent. Um, I don't want to come to school for a semester or a period of time. Uh, I also believe quarantine, the 10 or 14 day quarantine will be less this year, but I believe it still might exist uh, where we'll have students out for a period of time of 10 to 14 days. That might be another group. So let me pause there and just check for understanding because what the board would have to discuss and eventually direct um, we could come back next month either with no revisions to this policy, you're not going to direct me to use this policy, or you are going to direct me to use this policy and you would like to see what, what we would propose and my team would propose in terms of qualifying students and a remote program. So let me just pause there, because that's a lot to take in. How do you differentiate um so it says in here, educational program outside of a school. Does this mean that it has to be an electronic program? How does that, how is it differentiated? For example, if we're outplacing a student who maybe has an IEP, is that a consideration or is this cons strictly remote? Right, this is strictly remote. Okay. So it's strictly referred, so it, it doesn't include, that's a great question, it doesn't include the process that we use where we have, for example, a student with an IEP, we don't have the services that that student and needs, and we're going to have that student go to some place like SEAL. Um, that 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 has the services. This there. is more what we deal with the American schools. Yeah, this would be like APEX. You know, we provided a full semester of APEX for uh, students mm -hmm. who last year selected. They they said, "I'm not coming to school at all. I don't want to participate in hybrid or in-person learning at all." Mm -hmm. And that was during the pandemic. Um, Ten dash twenty nine. If, if you ask me to come back to amend, if you ask me to amend this policy and bring back a revised policy, would permit, for example, Mrs. Johnson, offering that, and we would have to define who qualifies for that. Um, you know, who, who would we say as a district is a qualifying student for APEX? Didn't we have some some criteria for that? We we did have some criteria this current year. We'd have to establish that criteria and present it to you. Okay, reestablish it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, I guess the other question is the way this reads, it says provide instructors that meet teacher qualifications. So, is this mandating that we provide teachers? Right. This would have to be licensed to credential mm -hmm. teachers. One reason, this is one reason why we didn't simply, for example, any student who participated in APEX, we didn't simply have those teachers, those students go off to APEX. Mm -hmm. You actually approved hiring our own teachers to steward their participation in APEX. So they had a licensed Lockport teacher working with them mm -hmm. on APEX. There is also an attendance requirement that students would continue to have to get five hours of instruction daily. Um, so we would 
we would have to roll that into the program as well and make sure that that's happening if, if we do do that. So really the question before the board is do you want to activate this policy and if you want to activate this policy and make remote learning available to certain students, we would come back next month with two definitions. You know, who do we see, uh, who would we recommend to you as qualifying students based on a year's worth of experience? And what would be the educational programs we would establish based on a, a year's worth of experience? Knowing that we, we will likely have families that will not feel comfortable coming back to school, re regardless of the right <coughs> structure and system is in place, regardless of vaccination, not vaccination, mask, non-mask, knowing that we, I hope, don't have as high numbers of students on quarantine, but we'll likely have students on quarantine because our expectation is about 60% of the student body will be vaccinated and about 40% of the student body will not be vaccinated. Um, how, vaccin many, how many uh, students participate in APEX? About 300, 300 second semester. Across all grades? Mm-hmm. And do you think that number will be above the 300? I think that number coming into this year will be much lower, will be significantly lower. Um, Mrs. Cristofero had a focus group of APEX students, many of whom um, are, are, are feeling safer, looking forward to their students going back full in person, mm -hmm. saw APEX as a temporary solution. Uh, most likely families that, that would advocate for APEX would be families who either the child has a medical situation, um, for example, the child has a medical situation that, that doesn't disqualify them from vaccination, mm -hmm. but that the family is concerned about that student either being vaccinated or coming into a situation where they could contract COVID, for example. The family is making that, that decision, that discernment. And then the other population is any, any group of individuals on quarantine. Now, right now our numbers, we believe these are very crude. We have nothing but gut instinct to go on that about 60% of our students will be vaccinated. That 60% will not be required to quarantine. So that takes off the board quite a bit, but of the 40% that will select not to be vaccinated, I can imagine some of those students might have to either do a 10-day or 14-day quarantine <coughs> if they have a close contact. So what would we provide for them? Pre-quarantine, we packaged up some papers, sent it to guidance, and hoped it got home uh, rather than providing remote learning uh, for those students but we've gained a, a, a fair amount of expertise in how to do this. Um, so probably some direction I would need from the board tonight is if, if you would like to see a proposed revision, if, if the board feels strongly um, that, 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 that the state's definition is the definition you would stick with, um, and anything we would bring back to you would be a draft. You are, you are not voting on a policy tonight. No. <laughs> okay, I want to assure you of that, that like that is not what you are doing. I would like to see what you guys mm -hmm. come back with. Revise one. You know, your proposal. Your yeah. proposal. Is there, a, is, there a, is there a different opinion? I'd like I, to see the actual proposal first. You'd like to see something kind of written out? Something written down, yeah. Okay, Mr. Lewandowski, yeah. Yes, I'd like to see a full open, no mask requirement, no vaccination requirement at all. Mm -hmm. Right, and we don't, you know, uh, the state does not have a, a vaccination requirement. I can't even imagine uh, right now, that's not even on the horizon. Um, and individual school boards are not empowered mm -hmm. to, to do that as well, you know, to make a vaccine mandate. Um, it's, it's you know, like I mentioned it's earlier, uh, the state right it's now, and it's in the, the declaration that you're going to hear probably on June 27th, is going to say that we're all going to have to mask and then we'll be back as a board to trying to decide you know much like we did through this the course of this year where did we stand with you know state protocols and state guidelines right so i will take this back we'll work with our team we'll bring bring back a, an idea of a proposal for you next month which would probably be a first reading i would probably not even have you vote <laughs> at that time um, 
you know, unless you feel like there's been a due first reading and second reading. Because Visual scenarios. Yeah, and I, and I will start in your board updates just giving you some suggestions. Great. I mean, but that, I mean, you're talking about a first reading. That's July. Right. You're only going to have, you know, less than a month after right. that that school is going to start. Right. So I'm not sure how long we can yeah, you can't, take, we gotta, you can't take we can't take that long. in August. And right. Go, well, you're not right. going to do this. And, and and that's why I would use your update to start seeing what we're thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because you might be in a position where this is a first reading, July is a second reading, and you might feel confident moving forward or not moving forward with with using policy six colon one eighty five. When it when it, you have a tentative um, con conceptual design mm -hmm. to the proposal. Can we see it prior to the meeting? You absolutely can. And this can make it more productive. Right. You know, because, you know, like we do it. other things mm -hmm. where we may give you questions and then you come and address them here. It, I'm just worried exactly. that we're going we're gonna to be we're gonna run out of time. August, right. And, and that's exactly what I have in mind, Mr. Ives, is using our board update as, as a time for you to see drafts mm -hmm. yes. and thoughts before July because of the tight yes. timeline and the lack of current guidance we have on this. And then also board members know, you know, directing your questions about that directly to me. Yep. Um, so there isn't any kind of outside of board discussion about, you know, outside the board meeting, the public board meeting discussion about policy. Right. Right. Mr. Navarra, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. I, uh, I was just going to say, technically, we can decide in August. We would just really overcomplicate things. It, yeah, it would. You technically could. You're right. And it. it probably would not give us an opportunity if we wait all the way till August to communicate to the community the yeah. options that they have. I think it would right. do, you would be making like a lot of people confused as to what exactly our official policy is, especially it's, mm -hmm. since our next meeting is how many days before school starts? Like, In the July meeting July, is about four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the, the August meeting, I believe, oh, is yeah. on the day, day of the first day of school. Really? Right. Yeah. Well, School already started. Session. We have to. Yeah. We have to have parents. Have act, you can't wait that long. Yeah, you'll you'll have to decide how you feel about six colon one eighty five. Yeah, you can't wait. We can't Most wait likely, that long. and then you know the board knows that sometimes when we've been under the gun, I know this is everyone's favorite, but sometimes we have a special meeting. We, and we will work diligently to avoid that for you. Yeah. So. Are, we, are we able to approve policy at our board retreat? Is that considered? It is a board meeting. So if we stick with the August 7th date, you can, that's an open meeting, and we could have policy on your agenda. And at least right now, that meeting I don't, don't plan on confidential items unless as we plan that over the summer. Um, so that would be another time that you could, you could make some decisions if we, if we keep with that August 7th date, yeah. Let's shoot for, all, for July, just looking at the time frame. Got it. Okay. All right, that next. Nice. Making policy is you're playing golf. <laughs> it's playing golf. Yeah. All right. Nice. All right. Next, we have public comments on topics not listed on the agenda. A designated portion of the board meeting is set aside to hear comments on topics not listed on the agenda. A person wishing to speak must sign in and provide all information requested on the sign in sheet, including the topic they will be addressing. The board president will call speakers up by name, announcing their time to comment. A time limit of five minutes per speaker per agenda topic will be imposed. The purpose of requesting such information on the sign-in sheet is to obtain the correct spelling of the name of the speaker and contact information, which will be used for any necessary board follow-up. And at this point, there is none. All right, moving on to our information report, our principal's report. All right, I am not going to read the voluminous principal's no. report, including discipline, uh, to you. You might notice that our principals are not here, and that is because I have encouraged our staff and our administrators to rest like champions. This is just a, a season um, where, where many people have not <coughs> taken time with their families since March 2020, um, and being, being wary that as much as we might want to think that the pandemic is over, I think you know, new work is on the horizon, like what we just talked about. So making sure that our team and our leaders are, are fully rested. So both uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Green are taking some vacation time with their families and both, you know, would have been happy to zoom in. Uh, but I think when you take that time, you should be really good at that. Do, do that well. A um, few things that they highlighted on their behalf, what a spectacular graduation, um, you know, uh, I, 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 I think it'll make uh, Mr. Bartley maybe a little bit nervous, but outdoor graduation, very popular, and just as popular is 
people sparring over whether we should do two ceremonies with less traffic or do everybody together in the future. So we will have to talk about that. People liked, oddly enough, I got a lot of feedback that people liked having two with less traffic. Um, you know, the principals highlighted great activities towards the end of the year, <coughs> science club, student equity action, band and choir, horticulture, and those activity areas, incredible uh, accomplishments. And then also we, you know, I've been doing this for a long time with athletics, and we just had a high water mark in athletics. Um, it seemed everywhere I looked, we were in a sectional final, uh, super sectional final, um, went to the state meet in, in, in boys volleyball, the surrogate wrestling meet, we qualified uh, state meet, we qualified eight wrestlers in, in that. Uh, Coach Josh Oster um, reached 200 uh, uh, single um, meet uh, wins. Uh, we sent track and field down uh, girls and boys uh, to state. We probably have one of the top uh, hurdlers in, in the state, even in the country. Uh, Gabe Zacco finished um, in second in both the 110 and the 300 meter, meter hurdles, very challenging. Um, and as a fan of track, those times were lightning fast. Um, so just so many good things at the end of the year, uh, really, that went on. Uh, you can see discipline. Um, you know, as masks some come off, we're assured that all of our friends like norovirus and colds and strep will come back and back all in, as Mr. Bartley knows, also means that, that some of our discipline changes too. We, we get back to some things. So you can see that we still had no ID, tardy to school. Um, some of our electronic device were our major infractions. I was pleased to see in the last six weeks and you know, Mrs. Green can comment on this. Some of those things that you just really don't want to see in schools were, were not part of the scene. Um, and so we'll see where that goes, um, where, where that, that, that lands. Any questions? One of the things I, I think we should recognize is that during the month of June, typically everything that was going on in June is already over. Right. And the administration, the staff, and particularly the students deserve a lot of credit Graduation was over. They still committed. They, they, they held their heads high. They, they, they were proud porters out there. And they, not an easy thing to do in the middle of your summer when you're going to go June. They stayed with it. They stayed committed. So Absolutely. I, I, when I was reading this, I couldn't have been more impressed. It was very impressive that, that you know, the very, the very next Monday after graduation, this campus looked like a regular school day. Yeah. And it's been that way really up until last week, last Friday, when we were in the state meeting volleyball. Very impressive. And now kids coming back for camp, right? Both in activities and athletics. Yeah. It's, it's, neat. it's a neat piece of recovery. Um, attendance, um, you can take a look at attendance and student uh, uh, enrollment. We had our first major dip in about the last three weeks. We went down to 88% attendance from our historic uh, 93 to 95%. Um, uh, as was mentioned earlier in the public comment, uh, quarantine was very, very difficult, very challenging. That's one of those areas that we are looking. Uh, as you know, uh, I was in a consor consortium of superintendents who wrote a letter to the state asking for a reconciliation between two guidelines. One guideline that said it was safe to seat students three to six feet apart. Another guideline that said um, if you were um, uh, closer than six feet to a student with COVID, you had to quarantine. So as the board knows, we had about five to 7% of our students, about anywhere between 220 and 300 students on a 14-day quarantine. And it is accurate, we've shared our data with the state, that over the course of this entire year, we probably had to put um, about 3,000 incidents of 14-day quarantine. And uh, we have no known active COVID cases out of those quarantines. So we're really asking for a reconsideration of that, especially at the high school level just because of the kind of system that we are. So that is the principle, unless I can answer any questions. A great, great point, Mr. Ives. Thank you. All right, moving on to our district reports. And now it's our information reports for restorative practices. I think we have a handout here. You are up. And, and board members do have a handout and some samples, and some more samples are coming. Um, And this is Matt, Mr. Matt Bartley, assistant principal. And um, 
uh, Mrs. Uh, Trevanna Green, who's been with us, an alumni, but who's been with us for five years. Um, it's her fifth year in the district, in, in COVID years. It's her first year, but she's, she's you know, well past tenure now, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> for sure. Well, I also want to thank you for this, uh, this time to present you some more information on restorative practices. I actually find it pretty convenient, uh, you know, tonight that we get to talk a little more about um, restorative practices after the presentation, um, the DMG presentation, talking about uh, MTSS and, you know, what we need to do to help struggling students with their academic achievement. As we know, okay, kids that struggle with discipline tend to struggle with academic achievement. Um, and I love the, the, the graphics on the presentation that showed the little puzzle pieces with the deans, counselors, social workers, because you know those, those are the individuals that are driving forces uh, behind the restorative practices. But, does it, but it's not limited to you know, the, the classroom teachers that are doing it um, in the trenches in the classroom. Um, so I just wanted to uh, 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 you know, introduce you guys to uh, uh, some of the, the stuff on the handout, um, what are restorative practices, the core values of restorative me uh, mediation, stages of restorative practices, and then you kind of direct you to uh, Mrs. Trevanna Green here, um, who's going to you know, highlight some of the things that we're doing here at Lockport. Um, and a couple things that we decided to highlight with you because embedded in, in those pieces are, are several things that we're doing with restorative practices. And one's going to be a re-engagement conference and, uh, and, and that will be on slide six, the, the one of the second to last slide. And um, the very last slide that uh, just talks about some of the common practices that we use um, in restorative uh, you know, justices. Okay. So, this is great. Yes. Okay. So one thing, a question that we always get about restorative practices, is it going to take away the alternative assignment? So alternative assignment would be a suspension, a detention, um, a BIC, and it does not. It's actually added to that piece so that they can restore the relationship <sighs> or the harm that they have done. So in that, the re-engagement conference plan, that sheet that I handed out, um, you will see that if you go to, yep, just stay there, um, it can consists of the student, the parent, the counselor, the social worker. Um, there could be other people, such as if there's a drug offense, we could have somebody from Rosecrans come in and help us with that plan for the student to be re-engaged to school and as you will see we go through a number of things so tutoring supports um, we may um, readjust their schedule things of that nature and you will also see that we all initial off on it and we're able to go back and revisit that plan because the plan for the follow-up is the most important part um, not only of just coming up with the plan but the follow-up um, there's also a reflection piece that we do in the BIC room that um, Jameson, Oster, Dana Capco, and Eileen Sullivan work directly with the child um, to also follow up. And that kind of goes hand in hand with if we need to follow up with them again in several steps. So they could be seeing a social worker, they could be seeing a counselor, um, they could come back to us as a dean. We don't want it ever to be that we're just suspending them and then we're done with them. We want to follow up and make sure that they've learned from what it is, they've acknowledged it. And in that acknowledgement piece, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're apologizing or that they say they're sorry. All they're doing is acknowledging that they've affected not only themselves, but the community that they live in. I think that uh, acknowledgement piece um, is, is huge and, and something that um, we look to extract from the student with those think sheets um, you know, that we, we shared with you and that uh, we use in our behavioral improvement center because um, that gives us feedback where that student is, where their mindset is, just the way they answer those questions. 
it could tell us, hey, you see how we answered this question? We definitely need to follow up with the student, talk to our social worker, guidance counselor. Um, he needs a, a little more support. Where other students, you know, um, they just hit it on the money. They show remorse. Um, they have a plan, so they don't make the same mistake, uh, you know, twice. Um, and uh, we're hoping that, you know, as we embed these restorative practices in our classrooms and our, in our, our dean's office, our social workers, our guidance counselors, and a lot of our, our SEL components in the classroom, um, that, you know, our culture and climate just continues to, to strive and we can build on it. Yeah. Who, who wrote this? Who, who like wrote the questions on here and how this is formatted? Just Absolutely. So Jameson Oster worked with the BIC team and then the deans also saw it. So to, also to give you some background on that, um, I know when I came in on, in my first year as a dean, I, I did a PD development with uh, Mrs. Trish Sermon, and uh, we had a, a book, um, I forget the title, uh, Carrots or, or Sticks, something of that nature, and it talked about restorative practices in the classrooms, and it, it gave examples of think sheets and, and questions that we should be using in the dean's office and as teachers when, and when, when and students are misbehaving. And we sort of just modified that and built on that. And, uh, you know, and that's how the, a lot of those questions were, you know, came, came to uh, where they're at now. I thought that restorative practice became a big buzzword in schools as a result of Senate Bill 100. And Senate Bill 100, some of you may or may know, had to do with there were a high number of uh, black and brown students being expelled from school. So it was a way to have steps in between before they came to that ultimate, you're out of the school. You know, some kind of uh, mitigation in between. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely the uh, restorative practices, um, you know, the, the, the professional development and the use of that, um, you know, started to you really roll out with Senate Bill, um, uh, you know, yeah. And uh, it, I, the, the funny thing was, is a lot of the, the restorative practices um, it, were being used, but I think now uh, they're, they're just, they're being more recognized and um, they're, they're directed with a little more purpose um, rather than, you know, here and there. So have our rates of expulsion and suspension went down? Um, our suspension, you know, rates have definitely gone down um, tremendously this year, in the past year, yeah. So just to speak yeah. on what you guys can mark this down as like my favorite board meeting ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we're, we're, what Luann's going off of is with Senate Bill 100, like everything that we've heard tonight from that presentation to this presentation is a proactive approach to addressing stu concerns with students, whether it's academic, whether it's discipline, things like that. So um, just in looking at this, Luann, I think that this is just a proactive approach to kind of get students to understand their situation better and the effects that they've had on their peers and their community mm -hmm. before it gets to that level of the expulsion. I got yeah. That. Yeah. I got that. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but with this re-engagement conference plan here, mm -hmm. so this is any time a student has been removed from the, you would do this any time a student's been removed from the learning environment. So this wouldn't go for, you know, no IDs or just detentions. Bit. Yes. Things like that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I appreciate with restorative practices, there's something really important that Mr. Bartley and, and, and Mrs. Green said. You know, the, the idea is anytime we do something that we're not proud of, that we wish we didn't do, I find that students, no matter what, know that that was something that they weren't proud of, know that that was something they shouldn't have been done, but might be at a stage in their life that that's hard emotionally to come to grips with it. So first we have to restore ourself to ourself. We have to get whole ourselves. Then we have to get whole with the people around us that we might have harmed. Then we have to get whole with the community. And uh, to your point, Mrs. Johnson, Senate, one bill, Senate Bill 100 also acknowledged that a punishment does not in and of itself do that. Um, and working with teenagers, 
Um, I think zero tolerance is something you heard very much um, for a, quite some time. And that out operated on the, the presumption that we could punish our way out of teaching new behaviors. And that, that just wasn't the case. Um, all the work here, the really fine work here, is based on a psychological principle called rational situation analysis. That doesn't everybody deserve a pause between the emotion you're feeling and walking back through what happened, why did it happen, what did I do, what could I have done differently. Just a psychological um, uh, approach to get those different levels of restoration. Because ultimately, um, to, to change behavior, what we want is a change. <laughs> and, and we know change is hard for human beings. You know, much less people, much less children, right? Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what, you know, um, Mr. Bartley, it was a sermon, uh, Mrs. Green and her dean colleagues are, are really going for is to see that change. I just one question. Are all of these team members required to meet after, so if a student goes to the, comes back, student, the parent, the dean, everyone? Yeah, so, so okay. typically, yeah. you know, a, basically a Google, Google Calendar invite comes out right. and okay. for the re-engagement conference, the counselor, social worker, uh, Dean, um, AP are, are present unless something you know you know is just keeping them from that meeting, um, and then we go through uh, the Dean leads and facilitates that meeting. Um, great, it, I just found that it's been an outstanding way to, to build those relationships with those households mm -hmm. um, because everyone's learning and, and everyone's right. working as a team to uh, you know you know for a common goal. And I think the, the, the parents and the families are really appreciating the compassion I think it shows really making those connections because, you know, when they come back, there was a time where, a, a period of time, they weren't in class, they weren't in school, which, you know, I think we all know is the most serious thing that can happen to a student is them being removed from their classrooms and their education. Um, but during that time, we're doing check-ins. Deans are calling them at home. How's everything going? Are you keeping up with your work? Are you communicating with your teachers? We're communicating with these, these social workers and the guidance counselors. Hey, have you had an opportunity to check in with, you know, you know Johnny and see how he's doing um, while he's out of school? You know, re-engagement conference coming up. We wanna make sure he comes back, you know, you know ready to learn and back on track. And uh, we're just finding a lot of success. We're, the, the turnover rate, we're not seeing Johnny the, the very next day or, or a week later for the same infraction. It's just not. It's just not happening. You, so you, the parents are uh, supportive of this process and they're engaged in the mm -hmm. process. Very, very. Yeah. Um, because also one of the things that we're we're starting to implement, um, you know, typically with Senate Bill 100, um, some of our uh, you know resolutions that used to be five days out, ten days out, um, you know, really uh, don't extend past three days of external. Um, but sometimes the infractions, we feel like we still need some more time with that student um, before, before we, you know, put them back into the classroom. So that's where our behavior improvement center becomes really important because then we can extend these restorative practices in there. And the parents appreciate that. And sometimes we'll say, hey, depending how he does in the behavior improvement center on this day and this day, um, we're hoping we can maybe get him back in class, you know, in his classrooms a day or even a two days earlier because of the progress he's making, mm -hmm. you know, he's ready. Do you provide tutors for those kids? Sure. We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah, we talk about the tutoring supports uh, in the re-engagement conference. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I like these, as Dr. Shaw said, I like this, these structures as well. Do you ever get into a situation where you're engaging the parents and the parents, I would think the parents may know that child better than we do? Do they say? Do, do they come up and say, "Hey, what about some alternative other things that like to work?" Because they said, "You know, my child, this their type of child, this works well." Do they ever bring that into the process? And do you accept that? Y yes, and a lot of it sometimes is just like learning styles. What we're talking about is so difficult. Why does the student usually misbehave or act out? So they're usually struggling in their social setting or their academic setting. And it's their way to disengage, uh, um, you know, put off, you know, the, 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 the learning element that's so hard for them. Um, and their parents have insight to that. 
whether it's you know maybe just a teaching style of a certain mm -hmm. teacher that's just not fitting with that student yep. mm -hmm. where then oh, well we you know we can talk to that teacher and then we kind of you know connect and build that web, web that community where hey we had a great conversation um, with this family these parents these were some suggestions they made um, just wanted to let you know um, he's excited about coming back to your class excellent so, good yeah. Have you had to do any parent counseling? <laughs> 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 I'm, like, yeah. I'm just I, sometimes. I'm a parent. I can do some. <laughs> I was just wanted to say sometimes, okay. but um, you yeah. sort of practices yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, um, I think that's. I mean, we have great conversations, mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes they start off rocky, right? <laughs> and by the end, yeah. um, you know. Uh, we're, most of the time, we're we're in a good place and, and working as a team, you know, for, you know for, for, for the ultimate goal. Well, and you know. I was going to say too, like restorative. When you're at this reengagement meeting, sometimes you do have to separate and let it cool off, and then the follow up would be coming back to the table and sitting down and saying, you know, as we're working through it, we've come back to the table. This is what we need to do. This is the goal that we've set. And they come back, and usually once you give them that cool off time, they're able to yeah. come True back and discuss it. A lot of that timing is really important. Sure. The referral comes in. Yes. You know, uh, like a, an infraction that they're mad about and they mm -hmm. disagree about. Um, you know, right there in the moment sometimes isn't the best time um, to <laughs> come to a full resolution and, and repair what has actually happened. It's a starting point. Right. Otherwise, it's if it's hey, guess what? You have a double detention because electronic device fragment. Send them back to class. He's probably gonna get sent back to you the next hour. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> literally. Still you, you know? <laughs> literally. Right. Right. The conflict has to go. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, how many students would you say, if you don't have the exact number, just an estimate, um, have bit have gotten a big this year? This year, um, to be truthful, the, those numbers are, are, are way down because we didn't have the same amount of in-person learning. Because mm -hmm. you can imagine, you know, half of the disciplinary infractions that are in our behavioral handbook mm -hmm. just simply can't take place because they're not on school grounds. Right. We were dealing with different ones, like I, I refuse to turn my camera off, or you know, I'm doing something inappropriate in my Zoom meeting, um, or, or typing in something inappropriate. Um, but that exact number, um, no, I, I, I would have to get back to you. In this discipline that. report, yeah. Mr. Bartley, there were 15, yeah, 15. in that, that, that's a month. So a month, right. yeah. I, I was going to guess, um, you know, probably a half a dozen to a dozen per month this last year. You can multiply that by, you know, your school year, you know. How much, how much is the Pardon. usual people that get set to BIC, like during, like, Pre-COVID. Well, if you're talking about the number of students or number of days, that's going to differentiate um, two different data points. But number of students, I would probably say, uh, you know, typically only about you know three to four percent of our students may see you know the, our behavioral improvement center. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's typically your at-risk students. One of the things that increases the number of days in our behavioral improvement uh, center um, are when students refuse to attend, say, a you know a detention. Well, hey, and we start the restorative just all over. And this is still part of the deal, right. you know, um, and, or refuses to go to the double detention. Um, however, uh, as it's just longer. <laughs> just longer. It's just longer yeah. in, in time. Double the, um, double the time. <laughs> which, you know, we as a dean's department, we're paying attention to that. We want to try and bring those numbers down. Um, we're, I mean, we would like to eliminate Saturday detention, some of these things maybe in the future, um, you know, when we feel like we're, we're ready to. Some of, you know, those that we still need to, to use. It's still important to have some of those things in place to incentivize behavior. Um, it just doesn't necessarily correct it. So the thing I appreciate about this is it gives a student group a voice that typically doesn't have before.
course. And yes. that's what I really appreciate about this. Yeah. The other thing, and I know there's probably already plans for this, but a few years down the road when COVID is not necessarily a major issue, I'd love to see some data mm -hmm. to see, like the follow students, just to see the infractions and things like that. So if that's something. Yeah, recidivism. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. Great job, Absolutely. you guys you. did an awesome yeah. job, and thanks for bringing this to us. And Thank you for your time. Yeah. Yes. We'll, hear, you. we'll hear more. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <All right>. for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Another information report, the grading report, 2020 to 2021. Yeah, as Mrs. Christofaro comes up, um, you know, really, I think this grading report it produces a number of different reflections on our part, and it supports the student performance. Two um, strategies you've heard about already: um, setting time aside for students uh, to connect with their teachers outside of school. And then also um, uh, teachers coming together to work in teams to really affect instruction and, and, and achievement. And it's, some of the results are surprising in terms of uh, the high achievement level of students. Also, you have an email. You might not have had a chance to open up your email. But there were some board member questions about uh, this uh, presentation that I answered. So the paper copy of the emails in your folder. This is Krista Farrow. Thank you, Dr. McBride, and I'll try to be brief. Um, the first thing I will say is I cannot give enough accolades to our teaching staff who, they're the reason that this happened, right? Um, Bob just talked about the strong collaborative work style that they showed this year to really narrow what it is they were teaching, to really think about how are we going to determine if students learned it, and then to really think about how are we going to help those students that were struggling. So. Um, I'm always honored to get here, come here and talk about the great things they've done. Um, also, uh, by creating a schedule where we had time to provide students with the additional support within the confines of the school day. And that was great. We know it wasn't perfect because sometimes teachers would ask students to attend and they wouldn't. And that's going to be the nice shift we're going to see next year to ensure that those students do show up and that they do attend when teachers are saying to the students, you need to get some extra support. Our teachers were really creative in offering redos, retakes, opportunities for reteaching of these students. And they worked hard to ensure the mathematical accuracy of grading. So that's what I would say overall as we head into this. Um, I do apologize that I didn't have the numbers of um, students by class, but in the email that Dr. McBride shared, you'd see there's roughly 1,000 in the 9th and 10th grade and then roughly 900 at the 11th and 12th grade as you looked at this. So overall, we saw that we had a strong showing of students receiving A's and a very low amount of F's. Um, and on the last page of the report I shared with you as well, sorry, Matt, <laughs> on the last page of the report, I shared with you that we did have um, a prescriptive credit recovery that we ran um, from February to April, where there were some students who were um, extended learning is what we called it, but it, that's not what it really was in the historical context of how the districts run it before. So some students used APEX, and there's a prescriptive program in there where they kind of take a test, see what they need to know, and then that's what they worked on. I wouldn't say we had great success, but we had some students who were able to do it. For other students, you could see it was a self-management issue, right? They had trouble managing their time within the confines of the school day, and then adding on another layer was a little bit too much. Um, I know both Bob and I would say, uh, as we go out and talk to our colleagues in other districts, our, our A's and our F's are just insurmountable. So many other districts would talk about 20% failure rates, and what are they going to do in the summer? Um, I think I, I did comment on Matt. I'm on the one that looks like this. It's like the third page. Um, we had more A's at the freshman level simply because students have more class offerings there. Uh, if you look at our historical DF trend, you can stop right there. Uh, you can see that um, our lowest 
time was in 2020. This is comparing second semester of these three years. And we know and we illuminated the board to some of the grading shifts that we took at the end of the pandemic when students were not face to face with their teachers at all. And we were doing uh, a lot of asynchronous work. Uh, the next page uh, showed just this again, and this is why I apologize for not putting the numbers in. We were looking at this data regularly just to see what's going on, how do we need to support the students, and you can see that there was, a, again, a continued decrease in the DFs over the course of the semester. Um, the next page, this, the next couple of pages, uh, with the, the DF trend by ethnicity, the DF trend by special education status is not of surprise after what we just saw in the DMG report. And so again, um, some of the strategies by really focusing on looking at those students with CDs and Fs that we talked about, including PAC time, uh, will help us with these shifts in the future. Um, this board has continually supported those students that continue on and continue to battle for that diploma. So we talked to you a little bit about the, the students who are currently enrolled in summer school, those students that are in the park uh, section, and then I already alluded to that, that we did do some prescriptive credit recovery second semester, and then we have it running again this summer. And then lastly, I just gave you some data on our students who were fully remote. This is just for second semester. Uh, those students that were fully remote compared to our general students did not have as many A's proportionately, but again, did have a strong showing and we did have a very comparable number of F's between students who were in hybrid or in person and then those students that were fully remote. Do you have any questions? I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. District Goals Dashboard Report. District Goals Dashboard. This is really a document for a working document for board members and for the public to, to see in real time how we're pursuing uh, the goals that we've set a, as a district. So this takes us all the way through a full July 1 to, to June 30th. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, six district goals mm -hmm. in the areas of curriculum and support, facilities and finance, climate and culture, human resources, technology, and communication. So this gives people an idea of, of the small steps that you take to, to, to reach those goals. Some of the, the headlines, goal progress and curriculum, made tremendous progress reaching out to uh, Lewis University for a possible um, partnership, enrollments in Wilco and enrollments in dual credit, which are um, career and college readiness. Uh, we continue to hit our goal of having six to 12 months of cash on hand as really the statement that the board agreed on as financial health for us. We, we continue to be right in there despite changes in the pandemic, the economy, potential inflation, um, change in the tax collection structure in, here in Will County uh, as well. In terms of climate and culture, our principals continue to work. Uh, their focus has been on mathematics and working with mathematic teams um, just as an area that needs particular attention, um, we feel. Um, and the measure there was how many math students were getting help in that time that we had set aside uh, for that. Uh, Mr. Kandari has been busy hiring new staff. Uh, we hired a total of 10 new teachers, primarily to replace retirees. Um, a modest amount uh, of growth. We are happy to hire uh, three teachers of diverse backgrounds, important. Uh, we believe in, in guidance, special education, in English, and um, sort of replenishing the retirements, that whole issue of succession I've, I've shared. Um, when this was written, Chromebooks have shipped it, had, had actually shipped. The Chromebooks are here. So in an age where everyone is having supply chain problems, the Chromebooks are here. And then just a tremendous amount of job we're doing in communications to document our stories. What's the story? of our CCC program, what's the story of our park program, what's the story of our Student Equity Action Committee. So, 
Any questions about the? It's one way that we as an administrative team share our work with the public, with you, and then also keep ourselves in conversation about the progress we're making. No questions about it. Can I make a suggestion? There's sure. a lot, a lot of information in this report. Yeah. Can we only be, maybe I'm getting, I am getting old, but um, <laughs> getting older. Um, I have trouble, you know, and, you know, unless we get in the new Chromebooks this year, that you might have a little bigger screen if that's coming. Um, a more visually appealing format. Well, it's hard. It's hard to read. Yeah. And even when you expand, I know how to expand it, but then it doesn't let you page you up to, and down. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, all. Yeah. I mean, we could almost cut it into two pages. Of, right. I'm just a thought. Yeah, well, Maybe we're starting the... it brand new. It's it's Google Sheets that we use, and I think that's part of the problem. So I I, I suffer from the same right. issue, Mr. Ives. So, just saying. Yeah, I, I agree with you. We we you know we'll, we're starting a new in July. So. Okay. Yeah, I, have to, I have to magnify it too. As I do, well, as do magnifying I. Magnifying it, then you can't move. From, right. It doesn't let you go from side. To, you know. Uh, yep, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. It's true. All right. Next is our uh, Student Online Personal Protection Act, SOPA. So, uh, SOPA, is that how you? Yes. SOPA, yeah, SOPA? that's. Okay. SOPA is the uh, way that all of us have begun to, or are referring to it. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. um, the Student Online Privacy and Protection Act was enacted a couple of years ago, but becomes official or, or we're subject to it uh, July 1st. And. <clears throat> While we've always taken student data and privacy seriously in the district, uh, the law requires all Illinois districts to um, enter into agreements uh, mostly around data breaches and how organizations that do have our data or our students' data respond, what they're doing <clears throat> to protect the data as well as uh, responding to breaches if they occur and um, uh, the notifications and, and all of those sorts of things because breaches had occurred and then people didn't know that they had occurred uh, because companies maybe felt like it wasn't that important or uh, not, an, not enough data was breached. Um, so there, all those thresholds were established through the law. Um, and what this requires uh, vendors, and now that we're coming closer and closer, uh, all of the big vendors are on board or have um, begun to sign these agreements. Uh, even Google has finally, um, that one was, was one that we all believed would have been a bigger fight. And it was, it was somewhat of a fight, but uh, they, they agreed to the terms of the um, act. And so those agreements are being signed off on. Um, so the big ones for any district are your student management system, uh, which is infinite campus for us. Uh, Mastery Manager is one of our testing um, programs and that's got significant data in it. Um, Google obviously has a lot of student data just simply by the fact that we use Gmail and, and Google Drive to obtain those, I mean to, to store that information. Um, and, then we, and then you get lower and lower down the, the spectrum of companies that simply have student ID numbers. Um, in order to do logins uh, to authenticate uh, that a student is who they say they are. Um, so the, where we are with, with this, those agreements are being signed um, and it's a, it's a fairly quick two-step process now of submitting it to the company and then returning it to us. Uh, there's been a consortium built uh, for Illinois or with Illinois, other Illinois districts. So once one school gets one of these agreements signed, then other schools can essentially just jump on board and the agreement's exactly the same for all districts. Um, exhibits E and G are the you know, uh, way that we all in the industry refer to getting these things signed and taken care of. Um, and finally, it's, a, it's going to be an ongoing process. So. Uh, you know, the, the big ones, Infinite Campus Mastery Manager, Google, those ones will be signed. And then as, we, as new products come on board, we can't really uh, approve them or uh, purchase them without this information getting signed and taken care of. Um, and, then it, it, and it doesn't cover everything we use. So <clears throat> one of the caveats to the law is if the product wasn't educationally designed or directly marketed to an education audience and YouTube is a perfect example right that is just a general use website Twitter is a general use website uh, those 
aren't required to to um, be part of the um, agreement, only the ones that are specifically educationally based. Questions? Yeah, it's a really exciting unfunded mandate that we've all <laughs> um, had to deal with. But again, I, I think um, very, very, the, uh, school districts of Illinois have worked really well together um, along with the state to bring this, uh, you know, it was, it, re it was released two years ago. Everybody just kind of sat back and waited. And then in the last six months, mm -hmm. the, the ball has really um, gotten rolling and, and it's, it's happening relatively easy. And we're not the first state to do it. Um, I, California, New York, some other states have, have other similar laws. Um, and so it's just a matter of these companies seeing the legal documents and then agreeing to them and, and then signing on, jumping on board. Did you have a question? Oh, no, never mind. I oh. just answered it in my head. Okay. okay. Thanks, man. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Next, we have the district's 2021 2022 insurance coverage through the collective library through CLIP. Let's just Right. Call it CLIP. And yeah. uh, Mrs. Croy is happy to answer any questions, uh, as am I. Um, this really uh, shares with the board in, in full technicolor. Uh, in essence, renewing our liability insurance and refamiliarizing the board with CLIC. Um, Mrs. Croy has indicated some of the more um, substantial themes. Im important to note, since we've been a member in 2006, we continue to save over other vendors. So even though our liability insurance is probably our most costly insurance, um, we continue to operate it as savings. We also continue to insulate ourselves from um, liability. And as board members looked at the presentation, you might look at there is every kind of insurance under oh, the yeah. sun that you can imagine, but you will notice there is no pandemic insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, no current liability insurer offers um, uh, liability insurance for, uh, for the pandemic and any of the kind of consequences mm -hmm. for the pandemic, um, which puts for the board, just to remind the board, your responsibility of if, if you, you were, you know, ever brought legal action for a liability, um, being in a situation to say that you had um, addressed all the types of mitigations and, and safety protocols that would be necessary um, to keep a safe situation for everyone involved. Um, some of the themes that you're seeing, uh, weather-related losses, uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, you were uh, very um, far-seeing last year where we um, purchased the maximum amount of uh, insurance we could. Uh, this has become so popular. Click is almost uh, holding back on selling additional insurance to clients. We'd like to get as much cyber insurance as we, as we can. And there are many, many liability uh, companies that are pulling out entirely from cyber insurance. Uh, just because of what, what what's happened across across the country from a number of different bad actors. Um, let me pause there. Questions that you have for Mrs. Croy. This is you know really our renewal season. Now you know I couldn't read all that insurance and not have a question. Well, of, of course, <laughs> we would have been. You'd be disappointed. I know. We would be. Um, where's the? Right here. She's, she's right here. You're 12 feet away. Good. Um, the question on the commercial premium that you have, in the, you did a great job on this breakdown. Mm -hmm. Is that commercial liability or is that commercial property as well? The commercial premium is our, that's the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That is the, the property. Yeah, so that number ties with, so if you look at the other excerpts, um, that's going to cover the, the, the property casualty. So it's... Um, the way that I have that split in there, let me go back to what I was just looking at. It's, it's everything other than, so it includes the auto, it includes the school board legal, it includes the property coverage for damage to, you know, leaky roof or okay. whatever. It yeah. includes all that it, stuff. It's all, yeah, because I mean, I just wanted, because it wasn't solely just liability, it includes right. property as well. Yes. yes. That's all I need to know. Thanks. <laughs> That's easy. And so what is presented here does include 2 million of um, the cyber coverage. And then we've 
for sure obtained an additional three million, so we have five, and Click is working on trying to get the additional five that we had last year. So hopefully by July 1st, I will have the 10 million secured that yep. we had last year. Hopefully we don't have to call it. <laughs> right, right. right. So, you know, obviously when, when we did this application, I had to work with Matt's department on all of, the, there were increasing number of questions about cyber protection. Like, what do we do? You know, do we test our employees on phishing emails? Do we, um, you know, do we have all of the um, uh, two-factor authentication for high, you know, security um, programs, you know, programs that need highest level security? Um, do we have separate security accesses all set up in these major programs? So, you know, <coughs> Hopefully we answered those questions better than most and, and we'll have less problems with the coverage. Because yep. that seems to be one of the things that people are, that the vendors are hinging on. If right. you don't do these things, we won't provide you coverage. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so, so far, we're working to, to make sure we maintain all that. We have no problem. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that historical data, that helped, yeah. at least for us to see. Thank you. All right, next we have the Public Safety Office, Officer Inter Intergovernmental Agreement. Uh, just for board information, we have renewed our um, Public um, Safety Officer Agreement with the uh, City of Lockport and Lockport Police. And um, it, 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 since its first inception, uh, believe two years ago or, or four years ago, uh, it, it only requires the, the chief of police and the superintendent to sign off on it for it to automatically renew for two years. And so that structure, the public safety officer as opposed to a school resource officer is really the, the structure we have in place because our two current public safety officers are our District 205 employees and would continue on and, you know, when, until there might be, you know, uh, they might retire or they might resign. Um, but basically what that <coughs> intergovernmental agreement um, at your disposal uh, talks about how they uh, acquire, maintain, and sustain their police powers. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next we have the capital project expenditure and inner fund transfer summaries. Uh, these are a summary, just mm -hmm. always keeping the board abreast. These are projects that you should be familiar with, the central mm -hmm. um, repairs that we're doing, especially on masonry. Uh, this summer and then also uh, probably July will be a hard hat tour of uh, the library here at East Campus which is taking shape. Um, right now it's it's fairly well gutted um, and if you want to see the, the results of that gutting it's in the parking lot. <laughs> so, um, uh, but they're they're working apace you know uh, really trying to make our August 27th uh, so those are the fund transfers that we've done to pay those those current bills and where those bills currently Thank you. And then uh, finally, the maintenance yes. report. Uh, Mr. Thompson, great maintenance report. Um, you know, primarily it was interesting on COVID. Um, I can't remember if it was the CDC, if it was Gallup. Someone just recently did a national poll about what parents are the most concerned about going into this school year, and it was ventilation. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we have worked a good deal on ventilation, you know, uh, sharing what we're doing mm -hmm. to take a second look at our precision controls, which control our systems. Uh, but probably the, the, the main headline is here at East Campus with our, our chiller. We have um, a single chiller that controls the entire uh, system. It's a 900 ton chiller. And a couple of important components. When a 900 ch a ton chiller is replaced, it usually requires either a Sikorsky helicopter or it requires a, a construction grade boom crane which getting that on site is a significant expense. Um, attendant to that is a cooling tower. And we had a very long talk with um, our consultants. Um, the only way to really test things like the base of the cooling tower is to remove the cooling tower. And so we've really made uh, a decision that if we're going to replace the chiller, the cooling tower, we should replace that as well so that we don't incur uh, the cost of having a Sikorsky helicopter return or a, a, a large uh, boom crane return at the same time. The amazing thing is our relationship mm -hmm. with ComEd, as you saw in the report, um, 
we've done so many projects with ComEd that they're offering a $360,000 incentive for us to replace it because as you can imagine how much electricity a chiller like that pulls down. So as you know, the bottom line is uh, we are likely going to get a 900 ton chiller and cooling tower for about $10,000 is our estimate. Um, Media Center at East is moving apace and the structural repairs at Central are, are moving along as well. No surprises there with the masonry, it's turning out exactly. No surprises here at East as well. You know, when you get into that stuff, sometimes you find out things behind walls in, in, in the project I I itself. We're also starting to take a look at the auditorium. Um, the sound system, the lighting system in the auditorium is 25 years old. And we want to bring in an auditorium, a theater, a sound consultant, really to take a look at that system to say, uh, what what is, is needed. It's a good time now because, as you know, that's one of the most rented facilities in Lockport Township. We haven't been renting it much this year, but it'll pick up uh, again and obviously hosts all of our, our, our theater and our music mm -hmm. uh, and, and many other events. And then you can just see it's summer, right? right. Uh, there's winter and construction season in Chicago, and uh, we are doing all of the projects that you have uh, approved and and they're all here. So if I can answer any questions, um, lots of work getting done right now. Very busy. There is, I, I thought at graduation the grounds looked fabulous. They did a great job, they yeah. They really did. Really an outstanding job. Really nice. And just a side, one, one side, uh, Mr. Ives and I talked about this. I spoke with a few other people. Mr. Slager's helping me, uh, Mr. Thompson. But we are looking at the face of the district office. And even though it says the yes, home of the porters, mean, Mr. Thompson and I have some uh, solutions that we think could make that a more updated, a clearer spot, a more, more visually attractive. appealing spot, and a couple of us are, are working on that right now. We're going to move the bird nest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we'll have some kind of nesting roost or something. There you like. go. Uh, by the way, uh, just a little research. The last time that that building had an exterior, any exterior work done on it was apparently 1999. And that white color of the aluminum uh, steel cladding was kind of a lime green. So if you want to talk about fading, <laughs> oh uh, it's wow. white now. Yeah. Um, so that's a maintenance report. Right. Thank you. All right. And we have no need for a closed session. And then announcements, as you can see. There's a couple of announcements there. Yeah, very brief. We're closed on Monday, July 5th as the 4th of July holiday. And then... July 19th is our next next board meeting. Yes, it is. And hopefully we'll be able to bring you uh, uh, just a lot more in terms of what we know about <coughs> the state. All right. Okay. All right. Then um, just need a motion to adjourn. So move. There's no closed session? No. no. There is no All closed right. session. Mr. Travis, I know you made the motion. Who, who seconded it? Was Ms. Johnson or Mr. Yeah. Ives? Ms. Give Louane credit for it. All right. Yes. Ms. Johnson. She seconded it. Okay. Thank you. All right. 9.32. All in favor? Or do we need a roll call for that? Roll. No. All in favor. All right. Bye. Bye. Yes. Anybody Same not in favor, leave it. <laughs>